Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 1215 session of the May 25th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. It's your time to speak during public comment. You will hear an announcement that has been unmuted, that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have com commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Watkins is absent. Calentari Johnson. Brother. Brown? Here. Cumming? Here. Boulder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Being present. Thank you. We'll now move on to uh, our first item today under presentations, the presentation on Beach Safety Week. I'd like to uh, welcome Rachel Kaufman, our rec recreation superintendent. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Mayor Myers and city council members. Um, I'm happy to be here today uh, to recognize National Beach Safety Week. And at this time, I'm going to um, share uh, just a brief presentation that we have. And we'll be joined today also by um, Daniel Lawson Thomas, DC, and Chief High Duke. So we'll get started. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes, we can. Perfect. So, yes, uh, each year, um, the week Memorial Day is recognized as National Beach Safety Week. And we, to kick off the summer season, the United States Life Saving Association sponsors National Beach Safety Week, you know, in an effort to remind beachgoers to use caution in the aquatic environment. And it begins uh, the Monday before Memorial Day and ends seven days later on Memorial Day. And last year over the summer, you know, each the beach closures, Santa Cruz had approximately 500,000 visitors. In a normal non-COVID year, we have 750,000 on Main Beach. And, you know, with the governors beyond the blueprint, you know, date of June 15th, we are gearing up for a busy summer this year. And so each year, Parks and Recreation and Fire collaborate to spread the word on beach safety. We will be posting beach safety tips each day on social media through Memorial Day. And another way that we promote beach safety is through our programs. And so Jim Booth will return to offer Learn to Swim programs at Harvey West Pool this summer. And I am thrilled to report that our Little and Junior Guard programs and Captain Corps programs will be returning to Cal Beach this summer uh, beginning on June 14th. And uh, this is a great program that instills um, a lot of ocean confidence and awareness. And so at this time, I am happy to introduce the new supervisor for uh, sports and beaches, uh, DC Lawson Thomas, to talk to you more about this summer's junior guard program. Hello, Mayor Myers and City Council. Thank you for um, presentation here today. Um, as Rachel said, Junior Guards is back this year. And why this is important as far as ocean safety goes is that Junior Guard participants gain confidence in the beach and ocean environment through beach games, ocean activities, and conditioning workouts. Um, and additionally, um, the Captain Corps program is that next level of Junior Guard where the A's and double A's or 15 to 17 year olds have this opportunity to volunteer with the program. 
and they serve as role models for the junior guard and little guard participants and assist the um, instructors with marine safety through participation, education, creating a positive learning environment. And it is the perfect stepping stone for um, these junior guards to go program into becoming a lifeguard for future years. Uh, most of our current instructors are previous Captain Corps members. And actually, we had a record-breaking 28 potential captains come out and try out over last week and interviewed with us. And this Friday, we will announce um, who's getting those positions and going from there. Um, the program is gonna be a bit different this year. To help maximize participation, we are doing four two-week sessions with still a morning and afternoon session. So it's gonna be the nine to noon and the one to four still, but then only two-week sessions. And this is also what Capitola and the state programs are doing as well. Um, our program is gonna run June 14th all the way through August 6th. And that's what I got. Thanks so much, DC. And uh, now Chief Hyduke will be joining us to talk through uh, our top 10 uh, beach safety tips. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council. Um, Jason Heidegger, your fire chief. And uh, are you sharing your screen, Rachel? Because I can't see it anymore. Sorry, it uh, disappeared for a second, but I'm coming back. Okay. Um, so while she's bringing that on, um, I just want to highlight, you know, the, the entire reason why we do this is we want to prevent incidents before, they're, before they happen. And I'd like to take a moment of silence uh, just to recognize the traffic of a life that we experienced on May 16th. Um, a father was uh, trying to rescue his six-year-old and 12-year-old um, children, and unfortunately, despite the heroic efforts of lifeguards, firefighters, Harbor Patrol, the entire system, um, he passed away. The children um, were saved, um, but one, one life is too many. So I'd like to take a moment of silence just to recognize the realities of what we're trying to educate. In front of you, you have the USLA's 10 beach safety tips, and this is something, uh, these messages have not changed, and I'm not gonna read them to you, to you verbatim, but I do wanna highlight um, the partnership that we have with Parks and Recreation and the Junior Lifeguard Program. And if you look at these tips, how many of them are directly uh, related to the Junior Lifeguard Program and the increased safety, awareness, athleticism, teamwork, all those things we want within our community literally hundreds of children every year go through this program and uh, thousands and thousands. Um, myself being one of the product of a JG program, my wife, my daughter, um, it's a, the fact that we had to cancel it last year was heartbreaking, but the fact that you're wholeheart, wholeheartedly supported. Um, and the learning to swim, uh, learning the ocean environment, learning how to uh, interact with other people and uh, knowing what to do in a situation, that is why we have the JG program. It is such an incubator of um, creating good humans uh, for our community. Safety tips really wanna highlight the fact that talk to a lifeguard, they understand the conditions that change on an hourly, daily basis. Um, if you have any questions, don't go out. Um, and at all times, mother nature is stronger than any of us. And so these beach safety tips are nationwide. Uh, they don't change. And we want people to take these to heart. Um, and again, if you have any questions or concerns when you come to our beach, we're expecting close to a million people to come this summer. Uh, we want them to check in with our lifeguards and we want our community to engage in the junior lifeguard program. Um, these can save lives and more importantly, they can prevent a rescue in the first place, which is really our goal. Um, and again, I'd really like to thank um, DC and Rachel and the entire Parks and Rec uh, Department for their efforts in getting the JG program up and running this year. It's um, one of the more valuable programs I think we have within the city and I completely support it. And that concludes our presentation. So we're happy to stay on, still have questions or comments. Thank you so much, Rachel and Jason and DC. Welcome to your fun, I would imagine fun new job. Um, with junior guards, so it's pretty cool. Um, and I'm happy to ha see if there's 
members have any comments, I just want to share quickly. I just have so much respect for what you all do. Um, we're a small city and it's amazing that we have that many hundreds of thousands of people coming to the beach here. And uh, we have very, very few uh, accidents or, you know, drownings, thankfully. And not a lot of places can say that. So I think we just have an extraordinary trained team, a great fire in Parks and Rec. So really appreciate all the work you guys do to keep everyone safe. And I see Councilmember Golder and Councilmember Colantari Johnson. I, I just want to echo what Mayor Meyer said, and I thank you guys so much for getting it up and running this year. It's such an invaluable part of our community and our junior guard also and a captain and my husband was and my sister and my brother and my kids and uh, being part of the boosters, I just know how um, it's not only good for kids like body and mind, but it also really does create a community of, of, of um, little beach advocates and, and people out there that can help out moving forward as young adults um, or <laughs> as adults in keeping the whole community uh, safe in the ocean because some knows is a lot different than um, knowing the ins and outs of the ocean. And so I just can't thank you guys enough for all the work that you did. I know it was like hours of extra work to get it up and running this year. The kids and the community and the parents and everybody is just super, super grateful. So thank you for, for doing that. Uh, Council Member Colantari Johnson. Yes, I would like to echo those sentiments. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, the Junior Guard program, we have benefited as a family and it truly is, as Council Member Golder said, um, an invaluable part of our community. It goes beyond, I see it going beyond ocean safety, which is essential and so important in our community, but it really, I see it building community. I see it bringing kids together from different schools, resilience. Um, it's just, it's all around an amazing program. So thank you for the work that you do. And thanks for bringing it back. Council Member Calendary Johnson, we forgot to mention because Council Member Watkins isn't here, the request. We want you to take all of us to do the jump with the, with the, right. and we <laughs> want to do the, the big swim, but we want to be able to jump with the big kids. I'll need to borrow a wetsuit. Roof. Okay. <laughs> Let us know. Let us know when we need to jump lifeguard building. Oh, we'll, we'll definitely keep you posted on that. Okay. We're all in. Thank you. Yeah, I like it. And Thanks everybody. Just, for like a quick moment, just and, and Renee is talking about the time. I just have to really shout out to DC because the time that he has put in to putting together this program and the spreadsheets and I, I cannot uh, convey enough the, the work he's put into getting this program uh, up and running this summer. So thank you, DC. Thanks so much, you guys. And um, I can't believe it's Memorial Day this weekend. It's crazy. Thanks, thanks for doing that, and um, we'll see you back here next year. <laughs> next up, uh, we'll be, I will do a few announcements, and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meetings are numbers nine through 22 on our agenda with the exception of item 19. Ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Not seeing any. Okay. I'd like I have to ask my, Mayor Myers. I have my ah. hand up. Sorry, go ahead, Vice Mayor. I have a statement of disqualification okay. for items four fifteen. That's yeah, okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. And everybody would like to ask the qualification. Sorry, we need to know. We need a reason for the disqualification. Oh, the reason, um, Sonia or Vice Mayor. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, conflict. I don't know what officially I should say, but conflict of my job. 
Is that sufficient, Tony? We're voting on the resolutions for the downtown. Um, I think um, it would be appropriate to identify the, the job, but just to put it in context. Your my, employer is the... The downtown, is with my job uh, with the downtown, of Santa Cruz and is also partly funded by the Downtown Management Corporation. That is perfectly adequate explanation. Thank you so much. You. Next, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions. We have that. Um, next, I'll just make an announcement about oral communications for today. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda number, agenda item number 21 at the end of our agenda today. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of number 21. Next up is uh, a report on closed session from our city attorney. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. This morning, the council met in closed session via Zoom at 10 a.m. to discuss the following items. Item one was uh, public employment. Uh, the council um, met to discuss uh, ongoing city manager recruitment. Uh, item two was a conference with labor net negotiators involving uh, OE3 and the SEIU temporary employees. Council received a report from its uh, negotiator, uh, HR Director Murphy. Item three is a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, the liability claim of Brian Quirolo. Item four uh, was a conference with legal counsel and existing litigation, and there were two items of existing litigation. Council received a report from and gave direction to the city attorney's office on the matter of city of Santa Cruz versus Santee et al. Uh, also in the matter of Sunset Farms LLC versus the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, those cases are both pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Um, no reportable action on any of those items. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. <clears throat> Next up is item number six, which is the city manager report. And I'll have Martine Bernal uh, go ahead and give us a report and provide updates on the city's business, COVID-19 response and events. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, yes, as we've been doing the last uh, number of council meetings, we have updates for you today on the pandemic, as well as the, the homelessness uh, related items. And so we've got uh, Chief Hyduke will do a health uh, COVID update and then uh, Bonnie Lipscomb will do an update on the yellow tier and uh, its impact on the business community and then finally Lee Butler will talk about the latest developments with respect to some of the homelessness of actions and uh, issues that the city is facing. I'll first turn it over to uh, Chief Hyduke to give an update on the status. Mayor, City Council, uh, Jason Heide, your fire chief, back again. Um, so in front of you, I've got the latest update from a worldwide perspective. This is from John Hopkins, uh, the COVID map. And um, the U.S. is holding fairly steady. Uh, India, unfortunately, is uh, rapidly uh, approaching the point where they're probably going to eclipse us as far as overall numbers. Um, but again, the U.S. is uh, doing well. One thing that I think is of note within this is the number of vaccines that are administered. And as that number goes up, the new cases will go down. And I think that's really the, the learning point that you can uh, get from this. Next slide, Bonnie. So here within Santa Cruz County, um, we are below 100 cases in the county, uh, which is uh, phenomenal compared to where we've been. Uh, there's only two or three people hospitalized at this point, and they had an entire week with no one hospitalized within the county. So we are definitely heading in the right direction as a whole. Um, that large surge we had is uh, steadily decreased, and a lot of that is because of the efforts of what people have been doing, currently for the number of vaccinations that are going into people. Next slide. So within the state, um, we're approaching uh, approximately 50% of the state population as far as people who've been vaccinated. Here locally, uh, over 296,000 vaccines have been distributed uh, to our population. And yes, that, that number is larger than our population, but a number of those doses are 
a sequential first and second dose. Um, comparatively to the rest of the nation and the rest of the state, um, we are ahead as far as that effort, um, and we need people to continue to do that. We have more vaccines available than people uh, to give them to, which is different than what we had a few months ago. And that dynamic has not changed. Next slide. So if you look at the breakout um, between the eight, we're doing really good. Um, that uh, 50 to 65, we're over 80% for either fully vaccinated or at least one shot, which does offer some uh, protection until that uh, second shot is delivered. We're catching up uh, in that 18 to 49 uh, uh, bracket. We have 62%, uh, a little over 62% that have that shot. And since the Pfizer vaccine was opened up to uh, that age group of 12 to 15, um, we have about 30% that uh, either have one shot or the second shot. Uh, um, it's just been opened up. They are expecting that possibly by September, that, that age range, that five to 11 age, uh, that they will apply for an emergency use authorization. Um, to give the vaccine to that age group, which has really big implications for full-time in-person uh, like, like I think most of us want. Um, the good news is, is uh, the eff efficacy of that vaccine for that age group is really good. They're not finding a whole lot of uh, side effects from that. And so that's really encouraging news. Um, that age group represents about 12% of all the COVID cases. However, they represent about 24% of all the new cases. And that makes sense when you think of the age group uh, who, uh, of who has been vaccinated. They started with the elderly, the people who had health care issues, and they really focused on getting them vaccinated. Um, and now they're mo moving their way down in the age brackets. So um, here locally, again, our, our numbers are falling off. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we're getting closer to this. But again, that vaccination effort in addition to, um, you know, masking and, you know, paying attention to how you interact with people is really, it, it's making a difference. And so locally, we're doing really good. Next slide. So again, um, all Californians 16 and over are eligible, and that has been dropped to 12 to 15. Uh, you still have the same vaccination portals, uh, myturn.ca.gov or santacruzhealth.org or your private provider. Uh, and again, if you haven't been vaccinated, I would urge you to get signed up. There are vaccines available um, and there's a multitude of different ways you can uh, look for where to get those. Next slide. And then here locally, I'm gonna end with this because I think this is the best source of information is go to santacruzhealth.org. Our public health officer um, and our organization here in the county have done an outstanding effort um, of getting vaccines into people's arms and getting us out of this pandemic. Um, but simple things still work as far as washing your hands, wearing a mask, keeping your distance, and stay home if you're sick. They've also seen a, a huge reduction, a concurrent reduction in colds and flus because of the actions that we've taken because of COVID. So um, keep it up, we're getting closer. Summer is here, outdoor activity is encouraged, but again, put a mask in your back pocket and if you find yourself in a situation, um, just you know, do those simple steps and uh, get vaccinated. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you, Chief. Are there any questions for Chief Hyde today from council members? We see one. Uh, council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Chief Hyde. Um, with the 80.5% of vaccinations, was that the state of that our county percentage? That's our county percentage. And so okay. if, you, uh, if you look at that age range of um, that uh, 50 to 65 plus, we're above 80%. We're close, we're close to 90% in that age bracket as far as either fully vaccinated or at least one shot. Uh, the state as a whole is just under uh, 50%. Um, and okay. again, that's for fully vaccinated or at least one shot. Thank you. That's great news. Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> Uh, any other council members with questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Chief. I'll bring it back to Martin. Great, thank you. Uh, next I'll ask uh, Bonnie Lutzkum, our Economic Development Director, to do an update on the yellow tier and what it means to the uh, business community in particular. Thanks, Martin, and good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. So I have a brief presentation and I will share my screen. And I'm just going to go over a few slides um, about the yellow tier. And um, I will say 
uh, one of the main things to note in the yellow tier is that um, we have four tiers. We're in the least restrictive tier now. And this is a report that we put out, and actually Nathan Chu and our economic development uh, team, as part of our economic development team, prepares these each week. And we put this out through the Economic Recovery Council. So this is, becomes an official document of the ERC. And um, it sort of talks about each time we enter into a new tier, it goes through the metrics of we have to be three consecutive weeks at the next lower tier to move to that tier. So we're in the least restrictive tier now. And I would say that the main thing that's different in tier four and the yellow tier is that we go from 25% allowed indoor capacity to a lot of 50% indoor capacity. Um, that's some of the main um, distinction, and I'll, I'll just go through that in a little more detail. This is just to show a little closer. We put these out each week in both English and Spanish, and uh, we should have another one out uh, this afternoon. We usually uh, get those um, between one and one and two when the county posts the latest um, stats. So we'll update that and a new one. And we expect to continue doing these until June 15th. However, um, Dr. Newell did indicate that it was possible um, right now while we're planning on continuing these till June 15th that there may be an earlier, um, an earlier period where we largely return to normal um, based on the metrics. And if that's the case, obviously we'll, we'll update that sooner. So specifically allowable operations, um, this is just the lower half of the screen I showed you before. These are available through the ERC. They're also posted on our ChooseSantaCruz.com uh, website um, under available COVID-19 resources. Um, so restaurants, um, I'd say again, some of the main changes from the last this year, uh, gyms and fitness centers previously were at 25% capacity. They're now um, up to 50%. Um, and additionally, uh, movie theaters, um, are at 50% capacity. Amuse amusement parks uh, went to 35% from previously being 25% capacity. Um, I would also, the hotels and lo with fitness centers went up from 25% uh, now at 50%. And uh, finally, at the, the, the bottom of the screen there, the wineries, breweries, and distilleries went up from 25 uh, percent to now at 50 percent. Previously, there was 100 percent people, and now it's 200 percent, 200 people, whichever is fewer. So those are the main distinctions. Um, just to go in on a little more detail, there are some additional allowances if um, events, um, special events, gym, fitness centers, and restaurants want to require uh, guests to show proof of negative tests or full vaccination, they can potentially go up to 75% in the yellow tier. Obviously, that's a sensitive area, and not all businesses, gym fitness are going to want to do that, but it's something they can do if they want to exceed the 50% capacity regulation. And then finally, what will change on June 15th, um, capacity and, dis and distancing restrictions are anticipated to be lifted for most businesses and activities. However, for large-scale uh, indoor events, um, we'll have vaccination or negative test requirements for anticipating this to go at least through October 1st. And um, similar to uh, Chief Haidu, um, sort of referencing other sites, um, you know, if you go to the California COVID-19 um, uh, ca.gov safer economy site, you can even do a deeper dive on this. We have links to this, um, to this site as well on our Choose Santa Cruz website as well as additional resources for businesses in our community. And that's choosesantacruz.com. And uh, with that, um, I'll take any, any questions that you have. Thank you, Bonnie. Is there any council member with any questions for Bonnie today? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, thank you. Okay, oh wait, I think I see council member coming. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I did have one question. Um, and it's not so much on the yellow tier, but um, I've been having a number of business owners who have been reaching out asking about the um, outdoor dining. And I know that there's a state bill in the Senate um, currently um, to discuss extending that further and, and working with the ABC to uh, their businesses to maintain their outdoor. Um, but just one thing that's been coming up is people are been really hesitant around, um, you know, like 
some of the stuff that they they purchased was only supposed to be for a few months, and now it's extended to October with the possibility that it could be extended longer. And so um, I just wonder if there's anything that we can say to the business community or anything we can do in terms of further, um, because it sounds like it's been really helping businesses kind of come out of the pandemic, and many would like to see that it extended for a longer period of time as they recover. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, we actually have a, a request uh, for proposals out right now to work with an architecture or design permanent outdoor uh, dining. We hope to be able to come forward to you for consideration of some financial offsets to really enable that to happen so that businesses can invest in outdoor dining and we have some consistency at a lower cost point because that cost is high. You know, some of our initial estimates of doing uh, some of these permanent outdoor dining structures was anywhere between 40, 80,000, um, the size and the scale of some of those. And so we wanna be able to provide some financial incentives and offsets because we recognize how hard it is to invest in this space, um, particularly if you're using temporary, you know, chairs, you know, tables, awnings, um, to really make that jump as you're recovering from the COVID is it's difficult. So uh, we're hoping to get some standard uh, templates and sort of design for these outdoor dining areas and reduce that cost um, by doing some of the legwork uh, working with planning and building and public works and getting them sort of pre-approved from a permitting standpoint, and then potentially even coming forward to you uh, for some consideration of some forgivable loans. We've been talking with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union for partnering with us, um, similar to our microloan program. We can have really quick turnaround on these. And then the concept is that we would forgive a portion of the loan each year they stay in operation with their outdoor they can borrow from us um, at a low uh, sort of risk point, and then we forgive a portion of that loan each year while they maintain their outdoor dining. So that's part of our sort of strategy of enabling restaurants to invest in these outdoor spaces longer term. So we hope to have this out uh, this summer, um, and uh, it, you know we will come forward recommendation and sort of overview of uh, potentially extending the temporary for those that aren't quite ready for that yet but also having this option for those that do want to move forward with a permanent outdoor dining. Okay, and then if we um, have business owners who are contacting us, is it okay if we just put them in contact with your office? Absolutely. And uh, that program is headed by Rebecca Unit in our office, but they can contact anyone in ED. But she, she's running that program right now. Thanks. Thank you, Bonnie. Any other questions from council members? Not seeing any. Martine, next next item. Oh, you're muted, Martine. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bonnie. Uh, next, we'll have Lee Butler do an update on the some of the homelessness items. Thank you, Martine, and <clears throat> good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I um, will talk to you a little bit about the. Um, ordinance and the request for qualifications and uh, some updates on the bench lens this afternoon. Um, so first off, as you are aware, the uh, reading of the ordinance um, moved forward at the last meeting and um, the agenda today identifies that um, it will be considered at the June 8th meeting. Um, and I wanted to point out that um, we've got information on our website and an ability to provide comments um, on the ordinance on our website, www.cityofsantacruz.com slash homelessness. There's a link to the ordinance and you can provide comments right there on the website. Um, next up, um, the council is aware and wanted to use this opportunity to um, plug the request for qualifications that we have out right now. Um, we are looking for organizations um, can provide operation of nighttime only, safe sleeping sites, um, of safe storage programs, of 24 seven managed encampments, or even 24 seven sheltering options, um, as well as um, street outreach services focused on directing individuals to sanctioned facilities and um, mobile services such as showers and laundry. Um, also wanted to um, 
let folks know that if you have locations where some of these operations could occur, we're requesting that um, individuals respond with those potential locations. Um, we hosted a general webinar Friday related to the RFQ and our general homelessness response in the city. And um, we have another one coming up this Friday. The one this Friday is focused on bidders. So those who are looking to respond to the request for qualifications, we encourage you to attend that meeting on Friday. And information is available on the website with the um, RFQ. Um, finally, um, a few updates regarding the bench lands. Um, we had a successful move of the agreement camp that was at the um, Harvey West Friendship Garden to the um, bench lands south of the pedestrian bridge. And um, about 20 of the 30 campers in that area chose to relocate to the bench lands. Um, we um, also still have the area north of the benchlands um, occupied by the encampment that was relocated from the area um, in the top of San Lorenzo Park. A um, couple of updates related to that um, encampment north of the Ped Bridge. Uh, the latest federal court hearing happened and um, essentially maintain the status quo for the injunction, which is based on COVID considerations, um, until the next hearing, um, which is scheduled for June 29th. And um, we do have uh, a lot of staff effort going into that um, encampment. Um, so we've got police, parks, public works, the city manager's office, water, and various other departments working together. We've got um, some contract staff doing, um, helping with refuse management out there. And we also have two part-time staff who have been regularly on the ground in the bench land. And um, they've been able to um, have um, some great successes recently. Um, they've um, connected three people with um, family that were out of state. They um, got three people into the county shelter system. They just recently um, went over um, 25 um, on the shelter referrals that they've And they've been able to assist a number of individuals um, in referring them to um, connections to drug or medical treatment. And with that, um, I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Are there questions from council members for me today? Um, uh, council member Cummings, council member, uh, excuse me, vice mayor Bruner, council member Colontari Johnson, and then council member Brown in that order. Thanks. I just had one question. So. Um, if members of the public want to learn anything about um, kind of homelessness, we should direct them to that website. I just ask because I think it's just really important that when, when people want to understand what's happening, now that there's a website up that we can send them to, and that's going to be kind of a landing page if they want to know about anything homelessness related from here moving forward. Yes, that's the best site to find uh, the latest information, whether it's on our general homelessness response info or on uh, the ordinance itself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Lee Butler. Can you uh, speak a little more about locations? You mentioned input on locations. Is that um, through the website? If, if, if anybody has location ideas, and I know that several location ideas have already come through, or is this in conjunction more specifically? Thanks for that question, Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, and I appreciate uh, making sure that we're clear on this. Um, the, um, the RFQ is actually requesting that if a property owner or someone who controls a uh, site, maybe they're leasing the site and they want to sublease that site or that uh, facility, 
you know, maybe someone has a warehouse that's currently occupied, but they know in two months their tenant's going to leave. You know, we may have no idea about that, but that could be a location where we could have a, a sleeping facility or a storage facility. And so what we're specifically requesting as part of the RFQ is that if you have a site and you're willing to lease it or sell it even um, for um, any of the types of home service um, uh, operations or facilities that we can, let us know. There's no um, obligation associated with that. This is just a request for qualifications. And so it's, hey, I'm interested in leasing my site. I'm interested in selling my site. Um, I've got this one tenant space in a building that you may be able to utilize. So really we're trying to understand what other options are out there besides city-owned facilities. Great, uh, that really helps clarify that. And is that again through the uh, website URL link that you mentioned? There is, yes, there is a link to the RFQ from the same website or you can just uh, do a search for RFQ uh, homeless services and it'll bring you straight to that but you can go to the homeless uh, santa cruz doc the city of santa cruz dot com slash homelessness and there's a link to the rfq there as well thank you thank you lee uh next uh, is council member colin tart johnson thank you so much for that update lee um yeah a couple of questions uh, thank you for clarifying the point around sites i think that's really important and uh, we just we have to work together as a community as we all know that that it's, it's very difficult to cite these projects so i hope that folks will step up and and um support these efforts um so i'm just looking at i jotted down my questions uh, i'm wondering if you could just share how was the attendance of the first webinar that you hosted and then i'm looking online for the information on the second webinar maybe i'm just not navigating well but i, I don't seem to find it and then my last question is um are there other partners in the bench lens, um, county partners or nonprofit partners that are supporting the outreach and engagement um, and case management efforts? Sure. Um, so we had about 20 individuals um, at the first um, uh, webinar. It was roughly, I would say, um, half providers and half general um, interest community members. Um, and then um, the link to the webinar should be as part of the RFQ. I will check that um, while I am talking to you here because I have that open. Um, it may not be posted yet um, unless I just need to refresh this. Um, <clears throat> and so we'll get that posted. It will be with the RFQ um and that, that yeah i i don't see it that it's actually posted so um we'll um make sure that the friday webinar is linked there um and then your third question is uh the bench lands um that um does have regular visits by hphp uh sorry the homeless persons health project um as well as other county uh services and facilities and our teams have been seeking to connect individuals to, to those members. Um, they're, um, uh, and they have actually communicated with um, a number of folks down there and helped um, get them uh, connected with individuals who they knew needed services. So um, that is ongoing. Obviously, we want to expand that to the extent, uh, to the greatest extent that we can. Um, and there are capacity constraints and and conditions as well but we are looking to to partner with others as much as possible thank you You're welcome uh council member brown and then council member coming i um i this is more maybe a comment than a question but just given what we're kind of learning about um or not learning, but you know what we've heard about fire danger, and you know this, this is a conversation that's always on everyone's minds. I think um, I just want to really 
encourage all of us here, um, those who are listening out there, to really think about you know getting proactive about citing. Um, this is always a challenge, and this is kind of the, the point at which uh, our best laid plans have fallen apart in the past. And I just want to um, really stress that if we, um, if we, as uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson said, if we you know if we put our heads together and really roll up our sleeves and work towards this, then we can get it. But it is going to take some political will, and it's going to take community members stepping and I think just being as proactive as possible to make sure that we um, can identify some of those sites. I'm already hearing, I imagine other council members are hearing uh, since Highway 1 and 9 was uh, cleared that, you know, there's more people now up in, toward, you know, up towards Sycamore Grove and in other places that there's, there's legitimate, really, really, really con big concerns about um, fire in those areas. And we know if there isn't an alternative, that's where people are going to go. So, um, and, and probably more so as, you know, once the, um, the community services and standards ordinance is, uh, you know, takes effect. So um, just want to really stress that and um, just remember that when you hear more concern about fire danger, it often parallels moving people out of places that are, you know, higher profile. Um, so just that's my, my big thought. <laughs> just please, let's get proactive and aggressive about citing. Thank you, council member. Council member Cumming. Thanks, I just wanted to make a quick comment as well. I do know that last year, there's an individual who had property that I think is on 7th Ave that's still in the city limits. And they had mentioned, and they brought it up again, uh, I think earlier this year, that they'd be willing to work with the city to provide homeless services there. The city could use it. And so um, I can't remember who that contact was. I think they had reached out to Martine. So um, that might be in the follow up with if we're trying to cite. And I know that that. Um, you know, is on the border with Live Oak, but um, at the same time, really trying to work with the community to move forward on some of these solutions, I think is really important. And and also knowing that the county had mentioned that they were gonna be looking for 120 uh, safe sleeping sites as well, that that might be a good person to reach out to and connect with. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, and I do know that, um, you know, we've heard that uh, individual um, to the county, and I know that the county has been working with them on um, some potential options for that site. Um, I haven't had a report on that in, in a few weeks to a month maybe, but I, I know that they're actively um, in talks with that individual on, on 7th Avenue. Um, and um, in fact, I just wanted to um, follow up on Councilmember Calentari Johnson's question. Um, the webinar right now is posted on um, cityofsantacruz.com slash homelessness under the RFQ tab. Um, we'll get it on the actual RFQ page as well. Great. Thank you, Lee. Um, yeah, I have. I just have one question, Lee. Um, just sort of um, Council Brown kind of brought up my concern, you know, my, my question. Um, my, my understanding too was that we do have some active assessment teams that are going into our open spaces right now to kind of also yes. try to assist people and kind of understand, you know, how many folks are there and what they're trying to obviously find additional uh, shelter. And it, it, could you speak to that? We, we are getting obviously a lot of emails about fire risk um, associated with our, you know, open spaces. And I'm just curious if you could just let us know a little bit about programmatically how we're approaching that. Sure, be happy to. Um, you're correct, and, and thank you, Councilmember Brown and Mayor Myers, for those comments about um, the Poganip and the fire concerns. Uh, see our fire chief is here. I know that his teams have been out there last week and this week um, doing um, assessments of individuals um, in the area. We've also had um, park teams um, out and uh, water out at um, the um, uh, the areas in and around Poganip. Um, and so, um, Jason, if you want to add to any of the specifics there in terms of your approach um, and the recent data collection, and I see our parks director is here as well. Sure, Mayor of City Council. 
So this is something that we've been doing for a while now, tracking fires in our open spaces and also identifying those ignition sources, uh, whether those are fire pits, barbecues, gas cans, propane grills, whatnot. Um, and so we're going out in a collaborative effort. Uh, with, uh, we have Santa Cruz PD um, and uh, Water Department identifying these sites on a map and um, also educating these folks of the dangers uh, so that we don't have a catastrophic event happen because of that. So we have these sites located. Uh, we also have an overlay from our actual fire events. And working with Lee, uh, who's been working really closely with the county, we are not um, taking individual information. And the county is really clear that they want to make sure that they're not connected to this enforcement. They want to be able to reach out to these people and connect with them. But what we are doing is sharing uh, the information we gather with them so that they, they know the locations. And this is through our ArcGIS. Um, and so we've got, you know, GIS points, uh, we have pictures and um, we are sharing that information so that they can do that outreach. As we get closer to July and our fuels dry up, um, that's gonna become imperative that we actually don't have a fire start in those areas. Um, fuel right now is not um, as critical as it's going to be, but we are doing that outreach and education and we're doing it within Poganep, we're doing it in San Lorenzo Park, it's a continuous effort on our part. And it, again, it's in conjunction with all of our citizens. Um, but I share your fears and concerns and we are doing everything we can to eliminate that potential. Thank you very much for that update. Tony, did you have anything to add at all? No, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief Heidi covered it perfectly. So thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Lee or Jason or Tony or Martin? That is that, yep, that concludes our updates. Thanks very much. Oh, wait, I see uh, Council Member Cummings with his hand again. I was just wondering if, you know, maybe if not at this, at, obviously it's not gonna happen at this meeting, but maybe at the next meeting if we can get an up on um, the eviction moratorium and kind of what's happening with that because we've been, starting to receive comments from individuals who've had difficulties with uh, um, getting assistance and, um, you know, really kind of navigating that landscape. And I think the governor's this eviction moratorium is supposed to expire at the end of June. And so sure. if there's a need for us to do anything, it'd be great for us to get an update and to figure out what we can do to help the tenants in this town. Yes, happy to. Great. Next, I'll um, call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Okay, thank you. Next, I'll, um, this is item, on, item eight on our agenda, which is council memberships in city groups and outside agencies. Uh, this is the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authorities meetings. Um, and so I'll go ahead and call on individual um, members. We'll keep these fairly brief today. We do have a long agenda ahead of us, so we'll um, try to keep them pretty uh, brief today. And I will go ahead and start with uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we just had one um, group to report out on LAFCO. Um, the commission considered the adoption of a service and sphere of influence review for Scotts Valley Water District. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all we had in terms of actions that were taken that we can report out on. And so it, that concludes um, my reports. Okay, you, get, you get the award for the shortest report out. Well done. Um, <laughs> All on now, I'm just going to, by uh, who's on my screen, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, let's see, we had a two by two meeting prior to uh, last week's um, presentation from the county. And um, so we did discuss uh, items for the presentation um, and that plan. Um, also uh, working with them on 
continuing to identify um, kind of the long-term uh, transitional shelter and housing paths created uh, and needs and locations and wraparound services and case management um, available in um, traditional sheltering modalities. Um, anything else that I missed? I will leave to Mayor Myers. <laughs> Um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Other, other, uh, other committees or anything? I'm, yeah. Is there anything to report out on the revenue committee? Good question. Um, our team, do we? Do you want us to do an update on the revenue committee today? Our team, Bernal. Are you here? I think um, primarily we continue to gather information um, uh, regarding a potential revenue measure um, and we anticipate coming back to council in June with um, some updates yeah. and action. Yeah. Yeah, not much to report at this point, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next. Call on uh, Council Member uh, Kalantaris Johnson, please. Uh, this month, I attended the uh, Metro Finance Committee and the Metro Board. And um, just two highlights. One is that we had the um, annual performance evaluation and um, contract renewal. So that was completed last Friday. and. We're presented with a uh, uh, preliminary budget for next fiscal year, um, which is approved to move on to uh, receive a final uh, recommendation and budget next month. And I'll let um, Mayor Myers add anything that I might have missed. <laughs> I'll do that when I call on myself for sure. Um, Council Member Golder. Oh, um, Vice Mayor Bruder, you forgot to mention the Downtown Management Corporation. Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't sit on that board. Oh. I present to that board. Got it, okay. Vice Mayor uh, Bruder presented to that board and gave an update of things happening downtown and the other, I'm going to the other one we went, uh, that I went to was AMBAG and there was a unanimous vote to uh, um, write a letter of support in a, um, National Marine, not, not Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary um, building that they're a capstone project they're building um, at CSU and beyond the campus. And right now they're working on federal and state funds and it would um, provide service learning opportunities and places for student research and collaborative faculty research. So it seems like there's my update. Great, thank you, Council Member Holder. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have a couple of updates. The first is uh, the Area Agency on Aging did have its uh, master plan on aging town hall. We heard from uh, folks at the state about how the rollout is, is happening and uh, the introduction of uh, tools for us to be, you know, working on this have to have a local playbook, and so through the AAA and the Seniors Council, we will kind of. Um, this was our launch to uh, develop some programming and, and planning and recommendations around um, uh, making. Uh, responding to the needs of our, our aging community, we, we learned a lot about shifting demographics and the you know the, the rising number of, of seniors living in our state and um, uh, the diversity, and so really trying to think about um, you know how we incorporate cultural competency and you know thinking about equity and sustainability for uh, seniors in our community. Uh, it was really well attended, lots of energy, and um, if anybody is interested, I always say this, um, please do reach out and I'll, uh, I'll find ways to help. Uh, the RTC met at our May meeting. We discussed uh, the, uh, we had a public hearing on the unmet paratransit needs 
and transit needs for our community. This is a process that um, we go through each year to um, identify and um, you know attempt to to identify and um, prioritize unmet needs and, and as funding becomes available, use funding to 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 meet those needs or to try to address those needs. And um, you know it's it's been great because Measure D has allowed us to invest much more in paratransit and um, lift line and and um, uh, metro. And so I just wanted to highlight that those services are available. The critical services for people who are um, you know mobility impaired, um, seniors, low income folks who live off of main bus routes or are you know mobility impaired and need additional transportation help. So it's it was really nice to see you know that we're we're chipping away at the unmet needs, but there's still a lot uh, a lot to move to work on. And then I finally um, I just wanted to say uh, that it I want to acknowledge that today is the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And um, we, we are meeting during a time when lots of folks around the, the country and really around the world are um, recognizing that and um, taking a knee and, and, and doing you know, the nine minutes of silence. And I know we don't have time for that here, but I, I did wanna just say um, that I stand in solidarity uh, with all the folks out there who are um, continuing to fight for uh, and addressing uh, systemic racial injustice in our society and um, in police violence. So um, for those out there who got to head out, go out and be with, uh, with folks out, I was with you in spirit. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Yeah, it's, I, I've been thinking about that all day and I was trying to figure out a way to fit it into our very packed agenda and unfortunately, um, hopefully we can all, um, yeah, uh, be in solidarity and I and, uh, appreciate you bringing that up today. Okay, I think I have heard from everybody. It looks like maybe some um, council members have some questions. I think I'll do my report out if, if that's okay. Um, uh, real quick, um, I think a lot of mine were covered. Uh, I will talk just briefly about the 3CE um, or the Central Coast Community Energy Policy Board, which I attended this, um, attended a workshop um, primarily on the rate structure proposed change. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in our community um, regarding um, rooftop solar and its role in the rate structure um, and purchasing uh, policy of the 3CE board and uh, future of how the agency is looking at um, the, the methods by which it will achieve both climate goals as well as um, operational standards. So um, spent a lot of time speaking with some local solar companies who have a lot of concerns about this. Um, and this extended throughout San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties, as well as um, the original members of the 3CE. Um, been working with Tiffany Weiss West on understanding all of these issues and um, that issue, that um, conversation will continue for the next two policy board meetings for the, for the agency. Um, also, just briefly, um, the other item on Metro that I think is of note um, and um, is, you know, the schedule as Council, Council Member Commentary Johnson mentioned, um, we will be having a budget, uh, the budget adoption uh, at next month's meeting. Um, I also just wanted to let the community know that um, I'm on the Capital um, Facilities Committee of Metro and we did um, approve a resolution for Metro and the city of Santa Cruz to submit a grant for the um, Pacific Station North uh, affordable housing project um, in combination with a full uh, retrofit and remodel of the existing transit station. Um, we approved that submit $30 million to create that project in the downtown uh, and that includes 165 units of, of low income housing there and complements Pacific Station um, South, which I think is programmed for about 85 units. So we'll be hopefully realizing some of that. And we feel that that um, grant, which is, is very tied to transit oriented development where you have housing and transit 
combined in, in an accessible and meaningful way for we feel like that is a, probably a, going to be a very competitive grant for us to to um, achieve. Um, and that, I believe, will do it for me. Um, I unfortunately was not able to achieve, uh, attend the Downtown Management Corporation, but Councilmember Colder um, did present on that. Um, I think there's some questions. Councilmember Cummings, did you have a question? Actually, um, forgot that two other uh, committees to report out on. One was, and I'll be brief, uh, the one was the, <clears throat> the Public Safety Committee, and uh, one of the things that we did during that meeting is we had an, uh, an update on the Public Safety Crime Report, I think, for the first quarter of this year, and so if people are interested, um, I think you can find that online, but just interesting to see our um, crimes through all of those, but if you want to attend the meetings, that's a good place to hear of those um, statistics. And then one of the actions that came out of that was um, I think it was early in 2020 uh, when the quality of life ordinance was um, coming before us or the police chief had um, kind of let us know that uh, he was going to be doing outreach on that, but the outreach was suspended due to the pandemic. Uh, one of the things we recognized is that there was some overlap with certain provisions that at the time were being proposed in the TOLO, which is now the um, the new outdoor living ordinance. And so after that ordinance is approved, um, we're going to we we um, we provided directions to um, bring that to the public safety committee to address any gap um, after it comes back to council for full approval. So uh, we'll be reviewing those, and then with the criminal justice council, um, um, I think today's a good day to give updates on that as well. Uh, I've been working with uh, the chair, and we had successfully administered a survey to all of the chiefs of all the law enforcement agencies in the county, asking questions around policy related to uh, use of force and accountability. We received those results, and at the last criminal justice council meeting, um, they had determined that there was um, funding in their budget, and so they allocated $8,500 to an outside firm to compile all the data, and um, they will be bringing forward a report toward but we'll be receiving updates uh, in the subcommittee, which I'm, at, I'm on as a community member, not as, as a city representative, um, but they'll be receiving the reports then, and then it'll come back to the Criminal Justice Council for full approval, and that report will be made available to all the cities and to the county supervisors. And, and then the Criminal Justice Council will have, will have a website so that if people want to see the agenda, uh, it'll be the first time they'll have a live website, so people can uh, check that out once it's made live. And that's that concludes my report. Thank you. Council Member Contar Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, I had one other update as well. Um, some community members have reached out about the Federal Aviation Administration and flight paths. So I just wanted to announce that the um, Fresno Santa Cruz County Airport Community Roundtable is taking place um, in a special meeting tomorrow via web webinar. Um, from one to four, and information can be found at scscroundtable.org for those community members who are interested. Um, and just briefly, thank you, Councilmember Brown, for bringing um, your comments into this space. I saw, stand in solidarity with you and others across our nation. Thank you. The one other thing, um, I did miss one also, I just will mention um, at the two by two meeting um, a week ago or whenever it was, maybe two weeks ago now, um, we also had a conversation about the governor's announcement of the $12 billion for homelessness. Um, and we discussed um, some, some uh, around potentially inviting some elected down to um, understand some of the issues that were facing here, as well as some of the solutions that we're seeking to put together. Uh, and so we're going to scope those out a little bit more. Since that time, I know that city staff has been in contact with um, uh, both Senator Caballero and Cups about some specifics around some of that funding. And so I just want the council to know that um, both working through the two by two, but then also working um, through our own staff, we are certainly very, very engaged in understanding um, what opportunities there may be and um, obviously submitting requests as, as requested from our uh, state elected in terms of some of those resources. So we're working hard to try to see if any of those things can 
can be um, can be achieved for or brought to our community. Okay, um, I will go ahead and um, go ahead and start on our consent agenda next and uh, so catch up here. So uh, the next item for um, the public is our consent agenda. And this, uh, these are items nine through 18 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items nine through 18. Instructions are on your screen. Remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will, will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any items? And I see council member Brown, council member Cummings. So council member Brown. Yeah, thank you. I have uh, just a quick question on item 13 and I'd like to pull item 16. 13 and poll 16. Yeah. Uh, let me just double. Yeah, 16. Okay. okay. Council member coming. You're good. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, we have had item number 16 is pulled. And, um, we will all ask for any questions or comments from council on the remainder, uh, excuse me, on item number 13. Council member Brown, you had a question on item 13. So this item is the funding, uh, potential funding for our Pacific Station North um, pro affordable housing project, which I'm really excited to see moving ahead uh, as, um, as I'm sure we all are. I am, I mean, this is an expensive project and we do have uh, fortunately some potential funding sources. And so I'm just wondering if, if we, if you have a sense um, kind of based on the funding outlook and where things are at with our um, partners, what the timeline looks like for design and kind of moving forward with that piece of it. Will we, and maybe that depends on the funding, but uh, I'd just love to get a sense if you have it. So yeah, uh, David David McCormick. Uh, yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, De David McCormick with Economic Development. Um, yeah, I could answer that question. Um, as far as the sort of project timeline moving forward, uh, our development partner, First Communities Housing, they're, they're really targeting uh, breaking ground, hopefully in uh, summer of 2023. Um, of course, that is very contingent on this funding uh, or funding in general, but um, we do think these are very promising sources, uh, particularly the, the, the AHSC cap and trade funding. IIG will be a little more challenging. The, the pot was cut this year um, by, I want to say over 300 million. Uh, so this year's round is going to be a little thin, um, but we'll be able to apply again next year before we break ground if, if we're not successful this round. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, council member. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, open up our consent uh, agenda to public comment. And if there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, exception of item number 16, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. So this is for items, uh, all items on the consent agenda, except for item number 16. And I see we have two hands up. I'll go ahead and call on Ann Simonton first. Go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Mayor Myers and council members. My name's Ann Simonton as the chair of uh, CPVAW. I'm reaching out to you today. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't completed our current annual report due to COVID and many commissioner changes. We've only met seven times in all of 2020 and so far 2021. This doesn't mean we haven't been getting a lot accomplished, which we are excited to share in detail through a letter, if not in an upcoming 
<clears throat> council meeting if there's time. CPVAW's work is very crucial. Preventing sexual violence and sexual assault is doable. I've dedicated my life's work to this and I'm always researching international. We have been busy collaborating with many local groups and are looking into working with a group out of Boston called Mentors in Violence Prevention. It offers gender violence prevention leadership training. The idea is to provide mostly male leaders with information and inspiration about how to use their leadership platform, both personal and, pers and professional, to help create and sustain environments in which sex abuse, sexist abuse along a continuum will not be acceptable. This is not only because it's against the rules or the law. And yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, this isn't the time. <laughs> no, yeah, this should be public. Um, I just wanted to make sure. I know that um, I know there was a resignation from your committee, so I just wanted to make sure it wasn't stopping you unnecessarily. I just wanted to check my agenda. Um, yeah, it, it's not just about that. It's just I, we were supposed to have our uh, you know our thing in on a April our annual report, and it's just I wanted to let the council know where we were at and what we were working on. Okay, thank you, Ann. Yeah, if you could, I, we'd be, we would be happy to um, accept yes, any correspondence, and if you do want to come back for public comment, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but we can't definitely. No. Um, but please definitely uh, send the report, and um, I'm happy to agendize, um, you know, an update from your committee as needed. Okay, thank you so much, Mayor Myers. Thank you. Next, we have um, caller number ending in 9867. And again, this is for items on our consent agenda with the exception of item number 16. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council. This is Abby Young with uh, Firewise Group in Prospect Heights. And uh, as a leader in Prospect Heights and also member of a growing firework, a Firewise, Firewise Network, throughout the city. I'm in complete support of it, uh, item number 11. I was really heartened to see this item on the agenda, which would approve a grant application to the California Coastal Conservancy to provide fuel reduction and vegetation removal in De La Vieja Park and Arroyo Seco Canyon. This is a huge relief for our volunteer Firewise neighborhoods and residents as volunteers, we're all doing our part for this our preparedness, but we can't work on the scale that will be provided by these funds. So I'm very supportive of this um, uh, grant application. I applaud the forward thinking and proactive planning on the part of the Santa Cruz Fire Department, um, especially knowing that it came, they had projects ready at four days to prepare this. So uh, great, commendation to Fire Chief Hajik. We're grateful for his work and for the city's uh, moving this application forward. Thank you for identifying the opportunity and we hope for a positive outcome. Thank you. Okay, um, I will go ahead. That's our last public comment um, on this. So I'll look for a call for a vote on the remaining items of the consent agenda before moving on to Item number 16, which has been pulled. And I see Council Member Brown. I'll move the consent agenda with the exception of item 16. Second. Okay. And so we have a motion to move the items on our consent agenda with the exception of item number 16. Uh, and I'll go ahead and ask the clerk to take a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins is absent. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye, with the exception of items 14 and 15 as stated earlier in my statement of disqualification. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That, pass, that motion passes unanimously. We'll now go back to item number 16 and by Council Member Brown, um, Bonnie Lipscomb is here as our Director of Economic Development. This is the item uh, 
uh, notice this resolution declaring two non-contiguous city owned parcels on the 300 block of Front Street as exempt surplus property pursuant to the Surplus Land Act. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Bonnie. So um, Bonnie, do you um, have a presentation or do you wanna run through the staff report? So kind of get everybody up to uh, speed and then Council Member Brown, happy to have your questions and comments. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I did prepare a brief presentation just in anticipation that this might get pulled. Um, I'm happy to go through that first or um, respond to questions. I know there have been quite a few members of the public who have some questions, so I'll de defer to you. Uh, I think um, uh, Council Member Brown, you pulled the item. Do you would you like to see the presentation? Um, is that is that a appropriate? I think it makes sense. I, I'm, you know, pulled it also because I've been hearing a lot from the public, and I think it would be nice to just lay out what the issue is for those who are watching. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Bonnie. Okay. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so the item before you is the consideration of surplus declaration of city-owned property on Front Street. And I should I should preface this by saying that the city attorney and I worked on this staff report together. Um, he may uh, be best to respond to some of the more technical uh, questions about the Surplus Lands Act, but I'll go through uh, briefly in the presentation and um, sort of give you background on today and what is being considered um, at today's agenda item. So the parcels under under consideration are the two that are highlighted in blue um, with the yellow arrows pointing to them. And just to clarify, um, each of those parcels, um, the most northern one um, right here is a portion of parking lot 11, uh, the Front Street parking lot. Um, and uh, one parcel here is the south of parking lot 27, the Front uh, Laurel East parking lot. It's important to note um, as you're looking at this that this is actually the parking lot. Um, this portion right here that the city owns is sort of that landscape buffer that slopes up fairly dramatically to the corner of um, Laurel and uh, Front Street right there on the corner. Tried to make that a little transparent, but you can see a little bit the pathway through there. That's the parcel in question. This parcel right here in orange is not owned by the city, it's privately owned, as are these other parcels that you see right here. And there were some questions that came in from members of the public, so I did wanna clarify what is the area that we're talking about. So specifically, uh, we've been asked by the developer to consider the disposition of this city-owned parcel right here, which is approximately 4,400 square feet, and this parcel right here, which is approximately 4,600 square feet. I also want to acknowledge that the legal lot size of this is just slightly over 5,000 square feet. However, that includes some uh, public right-of-way and some sidewalks and, some, and we have easements for utilities. So the actual portion that can be dealt, developed is much smaller. And on top of that, um, it, it's too bad I don't have a photograph showing that, but I think most people are familiar with this little wedge is that um, the grading is pretty excessive and we're right there at the water table. So it would be hard to fully develop this lot. Um, for the proposed project right here, the particularly the Metro station, we are proposing to do um, an additional, a turn lane, not an additional, but a, a, wider, a wider turn lane so that the buses can come off of Front Street instead of Pacific Avenue. And in doing so, we need to actually take 15, um, potentially 20 feet of uh, this edge right here as well to enable um, that turn lane. So we're going to be taking additional part of this corner, which further reduces that lot. So I did want to clarify that because there were some questions about the suitability of these two city-owned lots for affordable housing. And I'll go into that in a little more detail. That is something that we take very seriously. And, um, and you know, I, I do want to mention these two uh, parcels right here are actual uh, public city affordable housing mixed-use projects that the city is pursuing. Uh, Pack Station South, I'll show you um, in just a minute is uh, we're in the final stages of securing our financing. We're anticipating breaking ground on this next spring um, underway. And this one, um, as the mayor mentioned a few minutes ago, is Pack Station North, which is a joint mixed-use project with the Metro. And 
stated in here um, in light green um, would be the portion that we would develop with the affordable housing project on top of some commercial retail and for the metro. So I did want to show those in proximity because there were a lot of questions about affordable housing and the, and, and the suitability of these parcels for affordable housing. So I did want to point out uh, what we do have and the size of the parcel we have here for affordable housing development across the street. And that's important because the size of the parcel um, is important for the number of units you can do, which relates to the financing. So uh, typically you want to see preferably, you know, a, a lot size that's about, you know, 20,000 square feet. Um, this one is just slightly over 20,000 square feet um, because you, you leverage for that unit. You can get more units. The cost per unit goes down the more um, that you can do. And typically developers do, it's hard to get them to do under 20 units um, that are actual affordable housing developers. So on a, a lot this small, it would be hard to get interest specifically um, in an affordable housing developer to develop that. Uh, this lot is under the minimum lot size for developed, a substandard lot size, and it would be hard to do um, a, a large scale affordable housing project on a parcel this size. Um, this is just um, to show you, uh, this is Tax Station South. This is 70 to 85 affordable housing units. Um, in the front here, you'll have three to 4,000 uh, square feet commercial retail. And then above is a new home or a new home uh, for Santa Cruz Community uh, Health Center and Dentist on the second floor. And then all of the housing is above that. I wanted to show um, this uh, picture particularly because of the Paseo. And this is a requirement in our downtown plan. Um, we have three uh, connections to the Riverwalk in the downtown plan. This is one of them. This is the Maple Street Paseo. Um, it's about it's taking a little bit of the parcel here and a little bit of the parcel on this side to make this wide Paseo, which then actually under the downtown plan, as you cross Front Street, widens to 50 feet. And that is a requirement in the downtown plan. And I'll, I'll show you that in a few minutes. But this is a really important uh, open space and pedestrian connection between our two really large affordable housing projects here on Pacific as it connects to Front Street. These are our, our renderings with uh, First Community Housing for our PAC Station North project. I'm not sure if, it, if you've seen um, these, these yet. These are definitely very much in progress. Um, but you can really get a scale of what 90 to 100 units of affordable housing looks like and will look like um, right here. And then you can see in the back uh, the newly reconfigured metro uh, tarmac with our solar solar canopy, uh, the, roof, the roof deck open space. And again, you get that visual of the and it crosses Front Street and then widens on the city parcel um, that goes, that connects up to the Riverwalk. And again, I'll show you that in a minute. This is a close-up of the center section right here. Um, we really worked with the developer and they came up with a great design. You can see some of these natural elements. This is going to be lead platinum um, with a really nice open sort of connection. This is the Elm Street uh, connection terminus, um, really opening up the project. Um, and connects to the Metro Transit um, in, the, in the back. And then here is the corner um, of where Maple Alley Paseo is. And so there is sort of a cutout so that you can have an outdoor seating area. Um, this is actually a stairway to the second, to the office space that's on the second floor um, and the Metro and the tarmac back here. And then the Maple Street, uh, the actual pedestrian uh, Paseo is here. This, this one doesn't show the enhancements of the Paseo, but I, I showed that to you on the earlier slide. And then this is the view from the backside. So say you're in the tarmac, you're on Front Street, and you're looking towards Pacific. This is what the back, the edge of the solar canopies with the bus tarmac here. Um, this is the uh, commercial retail, the backside of it with the residential above. Um, this is the downtown plan um, that was approved originally, um, originally in 91, um, adopted in 2017, and then by the California Coastal Commission in 2018 and amended in 2020. And these are just two sections that uh, the Maple Street Paseo and the importance of those three Riverwalk connections along Front Street, really connecting our downtown to the Riverwalk. And so this one that I was just showing you, the Maple Street Paseo, is a really important pedestrian connection. And um, in the downtown plan, it specifies that it be no less than 50 feet. 50 feet is key because it was something we went back and forth on. 
that is actually the width of these parcels that we're talking about. The full 50 feet um, is the width of um, both of the city-owned parcels um, that are part of consideration. Um, and just to put this in context, um, one of the other connections, um, the one at Cathcart Street, is part of the proposed development, um, the river riverfront project uh, with Owen Lawler and Doug Ross, and that one is a 60-foot wide one. And so this one is required to be a 50-foot street. And then we have the smaller one at Elm Street, which I just showed you a little bit through through that project. Um, so just to go back again, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the suitability for affordable housing. Um, so the two that we're talking about, this one, we just couldn't develop affordable housing on this remnant, particularly with um, the additional taking we're going to have here, um, the slope that goes up here. It's just not well smaller than a typical uh, single family home lot size. Um, and it's just it would just be too challenging. Um, this one on itself, sort of is a similar situation. If we, uh, I think it would become a little different if we included what's slated in the downtown plan for the public open space plaza. However, it is slated for one of these important connections. We've required it up here in the other in the other two projects and through this project. And this is the third final Maple Street Paseo. And so this is the 50 foot width. And I'm showing the additional extension here um, because it's important to note that if this private project does go forward, uh, one of the things we for council to consider is the development of this, which would stay in public ownership, but would be an expansion of the public open space. Um, obviously, the focus of today is not uh, this project. It's really whether or not council is interested in going through what under the Surplus Lands Act is a requirement, which is there's have to go through before we can even consider selling the public land. Um, and that is a noticing because this is part in the coastal zone, we have a requirement under the Surplus Lands Act to do noticing to uh, park entities, um, public agencies. And so that's part of what is before you today um, is to specifically decide and consider whether or not you would like us to go forward with this noticing. So what that next steps would look like would be we would send a 60-day notice if you approve us to go forward today to park and recreation departments and agencies, both in the city, um, at the county, and at the state level for 60 days. Um, if we receive any interest, we'll come back to you um, at, at the city council and uh, with a discussion and a recommendation of whether or not you would like to sell those at fair market value for an open space or park use. Um, and then um, I thought it was important to also mention that declaring the property surplus now so that we go forward and do this noticing does not obligate us to sell the parcels. It's just part of the requirement under the Surplus Lands Act for even consideration of selling them. So this doesn't mean that if you approve this today um, that you have to sell these parcels to a private developer um, or even to uh, uh, parks and recreation for open space purposes. This is something that just allows us to do the noticing and then come back to consideration and discussion. Um, and with that, that concludes my presentation and um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, along with the city attorney around the Surplus Lands Act and the process. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, helpful, helpful background information. Council Member Brown, I'll go ahead and open up for you for questions or Thanks. Uh, so I do have a question about, actually I have, I have many questions, but I think most of them can be answered through the read of the Surplus Lands Act, which I've been doing. Um, so the, the assessment of the, the value of the, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the um, valuation process because the parcels themselves are just, each of them are just under the 5,000, um, conveniently just under um, that it, to allow for an, an exemption. Um, but I, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering how we're, I, I've never seen a valuation done on a, looking at a land being appraised on the what par portion of it is developable versus what has an easement. I mean, you, if you have a property, you say here's the square you know here's how the square 
not here's the developable square footage. So um, I'm just wondering how that decision was made and um, you know, if you could, somebody could just talk a little bit more about that, the legal implications. Actually, from a, you know, from the standards of um, the, the uh, profession uh, for appraisers, um, the, the portion of a parcel of property that's burdened by an easement, for instance, um, is, is not valued the same as one that's unencumbered. Uh, and so um, in, this, in this case, if you, if you look at the version of the map that's attached or that's part of your agenda report, it's actually a rectangular parcel uh, along Laurel Street that juts out significantly into the streetscape. And so, um, so if, if one were to evaluate that on a per square footage basis, the portion that is part of the sidewalk and, and part of Laurel Street, and it's a very oddly shaped parcel, it's mostly rectangular with, a, with kind of a horn sticking out into the street, it's kind of odd shaped. Um, but you would certainly take that into account in determining its, its valuation because the developer would be required to um, adhere to setbacks from the curb line, uh, essentially, as opposed to from the street. I mean, from the from the property boundary. Yeah, thank you. And if I could get just a, a another, an explanation, just a refresher on the northern parcel, because is am I, if I understand it correctly, it's dividing. Uh, city-owned property, um, the north end of which is going to be the Paseo, and the, I mean, assuming we go forward with this, the other piece of it. But that contiguously, that parcel is definitely uh, of a size that would be developable. So I'm just wondering how the, I mean, was it how how that decision was made, like precisely to get the the, fake, the numbers that we did. Uh, the square footage of the two northern parcels was determined based on their property boundaries. We actually, it is a single site for that's used as a parking lot, but it is two legally created parcels. So there were no lines drawn in order to separate the um, the southerly portion from the northern. It was just because there were two parcels in existence there. Got it. Thank you. I I just I've been. I've figure that one out but so they were they are separate parcels yes okay. good question okay. um great i will um i'll turn it over to um my colleague with questions and i do have comments but i'll, I'll wait till after the public has a chance to speak council member cummings do you have questions for at this point i do i'll be brief and then i'll, I'll say my comments for later <clears throat> so the one question that that um I have is really related to the potential for um, these two parcels to be incorporated. Should should there be a, a developer, for example, who is interested? They have that center lot. There's these two parcels on the side that more or less equivalent are the equivalent of a 9,000 square feet. I mean, I just am kind of curious about how if the developer was interested in building or if there was a in building. Um, you know, market rate housing or just housing in general, if the city would, could the city be in a position where we could incorporate that land into the project to expand the footprint of that building so long as that went towards affordable housing, you know, so in a way it can help offset the cost of production of affordable housing because they wouldn't have to pay for that land able to expand their footprint. And so I'm just wondering if there's, you know, instances or if that could be a potential possibility since, you know, this the surplus land act, it seems like it's really, intended to increase affordable housing. And so could that be a potential way to make that work given those circumstances? Um, Council Member, I could just clarify, because this has been a confusion as well. And it was actually uh, mistakenly uh, printed in the Sentinel on what actually is under consideration today. So there are only two parcels um, for consideration of surplus. So are you talking about the two in the staff report, the Northern and the Southern one, or are you talking about the two northerly contiguous parcels, only one of which we're considering today. No, the two um, non-contiguous. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, if uh, and if, if the privately owned uh, land in between the two city parcels, if there was interest in developing affordable housing, would we consider that? Is that the question? Housing in general. 
you know, and yeah. then that way, you know, to be able to expand that footprint to allow for a deeper affordability into a project. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, this is an unsolicited proposal to the city, which is why we're, we're looking at it. So the developer that has assembled uh, the private property that I showed earlier in the middle um, in, in that light orange um, is looking at a proposed hotel uh, project. Um, they have not considered or have not come forward with any interest in developing um, that as housing or affordable housing. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from council members at this point? I'll take it out to the public then. Not seeing any other council hands. Um, taking out the public, and I am not seeing any hands up. Oh, there's one there. Um, Sabina Holber, go ahead, please. This is for item 16 on consent. Hello. Um, I'm just here to ask why on earth you would want to sell our public land to a developer to make a luxury hotel that none of us will use. I truly believe it's because the moderates on this council are all bought and paid for by real estate interest. Some of you got on the council by, um, I don't know, really racist campaign to recall other council members. You all know who you are. It's really frustrating. I'm tired of it. The city's tired of it. It's really depressing that our once progressive city is run by you folks. You're failing as a city council. You're failing as leaders. You're failing us, your constituents. We deserve better than that. And you should be ashamed that you don't even bring this up with the public until it's on the agenda. Where is your outreach? Remember how terrible Tolo went because you had no community outreach? This is another example of that. Um, I listen to the presentation and I find it funny that the city staff is always talking about how impossible things are. It's impossible to have affordable housing and then the council just goes with it every time. Who is the elected representative here? Who is? Is it the city staff? It's not. So please listen to your constituents. I know it's two in the afternoon, so a lot of people are not able to make this call. I have a meeting to go to in literally one minute, but I'm glad that I have the time to be able to do this today. Um, thank you to Council Member Brown for making sure that this can get public comment and a presentation and not just go through the consent calendar. Thanks. And I have uh, Vicki Winters in the in the public. Go ahead, please. I I just wanted to say uh, thanks, Sandy, for taking this off the consent agenda so that it, we could bring some public scrutiny to it. And I just yeah, I just want to really we need to not sell public land to a developer for a luxury hotel. We're looking at massive gentrification that is going to displace people and having affordable housing that's based on you know a median income where we have a huge shortage of housing for low low wage workers in our, in our city you know so just say oh affordable housing affordable housing it's really not solving the problem for a critical um segment of renters. We need low income and very low income housing uh, and we need more social housing and something that's going to make developers rich. So this really looks bad um, and I think the council needs to follow the public's will and not just be a rubber stamp for the planning department which you know, they know which side of their bread is buttered on, and that's through um, developers. So, so the pressure for, for the city planning department is, you know, to make squeeze the most profit out of every square foot of land. And you guys need to be the roadblock to that. You need to stand up for the people that live in this town. The city is not the planning department. The city is not the city government. It's the people who live here. And we elected you to represent us. So please do that and do not represent outside. 
Thank you. Next up, I have caller ending in phone number 8466. Hi there, uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld. I was just calling to um, uh, voice a concern in the Sentinel today about about the um, uh, proposed uh, 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 plan here uh, with the the concern that um, the uh, the southern uh, lot may be. Um, uh, if you include the uh, the sidewalks, may be more than 5,000 square feet, which would not be uh, something that would be uh, legally allowed to be surplused. So I, I definitely think that uh, that that needs to be reviewed. Um, I also want to just uh, recommend that uh, any any plans here need to. Uh, maximize uh, affordable housing options, and uh, I would hope that the city uh, how uh, how the uh, these two parcels, even though they're not contiguous, can be used uh, in as part of a, a package deal uh, to, uh, to to fund affordable housing, either uh, by selling them and uh, putting that those funds towards the affordable housing trust fund or using the land itself as uh, as um, in an affordable housing project uh, where those parcels would be 100 percent affordable housing um, I, I think there's a real opportunity there and i recognize today doesn't uh, uh, limit the city or doesn't bind the city to do anything specifically, but uh, there's there's a lot of, of uh, uh, potential that would be missed if these projects just get sold uh, without particular constraints or without a particular uh, uh, affordability uh, Thank angle. You. To them. Thank you very much. Next up is caller ending in 6871. Star six to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, this is Darius Mosini. Uh, I just want to uh, enter my uh, heartfelt approval, uh, well, not approval so much, but um, from uh, yeah, basically approval for this project. It's quite transformative to. The downtown, it will totally make great use of the parcels that uh, are highly underutilized right now. And I think what a lot of folks don't understand is that the uh, tax revenues that could be generated from you know this uh, all of these units and the tenants that are in these units, and them, they'll spend their money locally downtown. It'll increase the tax coffers. And when we do that, then we can use that money for, uh, we have more of the city, more money for other programs, including affordable housing. So this is, this is definitely the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other hands, I'll bring it back to council. Um, we are running a little bit late, so about 15 minutes late. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it back for um, comments by council and look for a motion. Again, this is on item number 16, which is a resolution declaring two non contiguous city owned parcels on the 300 block of Front Street as exempt surplus property pursuant to the Surplus Land Act. Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. I have one last question and then I do have a, a couple of brief comments. Um, I, I just wanted to double check as well on some of this land is, I believe is in the coastal zone. Um, I read that lands within the coastal zone, at least in the Surplus Lands Act, um, uh, are if they're, um, that they're not subject to the exempt surplus rules. So given that, I'm just wondering if there's any conversation that needs to be had with the Coastal Commission 
um, about uh, Postal Act. I imagine you've thought about that, but I just haven't thought to ask until now. Bonnie, did you want to respond or Tony? I don't know. Um, if you could give me a minute, um, perhaps um, let other council members weigh in and I will try to answer that question in a minute. Okay. Uh, any other questions from council members or comments? I, there's no other questions. I can just make my comments while. Um, okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Looking. So uh, you know, I just want to say, uh, you know, I, I recognize the um, the goal here. I recognize that this is a response to a solicitation. That this was not something that the city itself is is promoting, but is responding to. Um, that said, I I believe that um, if you read the, well, I know that if you read the Surplus Lands Act, the first sentences really make it clear that this is about um, a, a process for uh, finding surplus lands and the, the primary was, was is affordable housing, right? I mean, this is why we have this process. And so to not use our ownership of those parcels to leverage affordable housing um, at a time when we know we are at crisis levels. And I appreciate all the work that's been done on the other projects. Um, thank you for Bonnie for you know putting showing that to make it clear that this is part of a bigger plan. I guess I just I just feel like there's much more public benefit that we could get out of. Um, this process. And so the de declaration of surplus um, and kind of just trying to dispatch it as quickly as possible seems like a really missed opportunity for me. So, um, you know, at a minimum, we should be using it, the, it as leverage to, you know, achieve the maximum public benefit and get affordable housing out of it. So, you know, asking if the developer would be willing to pay above the appraisal, um, make a contribution to our affordable housing trust fund, things like that. And I know those are conversations that um, we may say today can be had down the road, but once we go down this road, it's pretty clear to me that those conversations aren't gonna happen. Um, you know, once a developer sees that it's just a done deal. So um, I, I guess that with that, I'm just not, um, comfortable supporting this outright without some, uh, you know, um, conditions put on it. Okay. Uh, I'll take council member Cummings comments and then Tony, if you have an answer and then um, see if we can maybe get a motion. Yeah, I can, I can answer the specific language of the statute states that um, uh, now paragraph one, which is the, which is this part that that authorizes the declaration of exempt surplus land. It's um, the part two of that section 54222 says a written notice of availability uh, of surplus land for open space purposes shall be sent to the entities described in subdivision B of section 542 uh, prior to disposing of the surplus land if in relevant part it is located within the coastal zone and five or 222B uh, refers to any parks and recreation department of a city in which the land may be situated or uh, of the county within which the land is situated. So parks and recreation department of the county uh, or any regional park authority having jurisdiction within the area in which the land is situated or to the state resources agency or any agency that may su succeed to its powers. So um, I think council members Brown is right, is that the, the central focus of the whole statutory scheme is to identify, or at least in part is to identify land suitable for um, uh, affordable housing. Uh, prop. But there are other public purposes, and in this case, uh, property that's within the coastal zone uh, has to be, um, or that park and recreational entities in the area need to be notified uh, because this property is in the coastal zone. So. Um, it doesn't prohibit the city from moving, moving forward, but it does affect the notice that we will be required to send out. Thank you. Council member coming. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I guess for the city attorney, does that, I mean, 
depending on the direction that's taken, I guess, do we have to include some language around consideration of how that, you know, the coast, this being in the coastal zone impacts our ability to move forward? You're muted. Sorry, I, um, I was on mute. Um, no, it doesn't because um, the resolution requires staff to follow through with the statutorily required notice. So, so it's written to, um, to make sure that the only authorization the council is giving is to send out the notifications that the statute requires um, and then wait out a certain period of time after which the council can engage in negotiate property owner um, and those negotiations could include whatever uh, terms the council believes are critical for the negotiation, um, as well as, you know, obviously the developer is interested in pursuing a, a hotel project. Thanks. Um, I guess <clears throat> kind of in response to what we've been hearing from members of the public, I guess I'm a bit concerned too with, um, you know, really moving forward in such a way as to provide, you know, for the construction of a, you know, higher rate hotel. Um, you know, I, I, just so the members of the public are aware, I mean, we have three large hotels that are going to be going in. Um, one is on Riverside and LeBrant, which is under construction. Um, there's another one on Second and French construction. And then there's going to be another one at Beach and Main Street, which used to be La Bahia. And I do want to point out that La Bahia was housing, and it was actually affordable housing um, before they decided to kind of cut that off and, and um, move that towards demolition. And so, you know, I feel like we, we have a lot of hotels that are going in. We have a lot of hotels currently. And, you know, this is a, a unique opportunity where we have land in an area where we could potentially, you know, work with developers to actually increase affordable housing in a project and we could actually make that work. And oftentimes the two things that are most limiting factors for moving forward with the construction of affordable housing is land or funding. And so I feel like this would be a really good way for us to work developer to kind of have a win-win where we could you know, build more housing and build more affordable housing and subsidize those costs towards the developers. And so um, I'm prepared to make a motion. I just sent Bonnie the language, but I'll read it. And it's really been, you know, trying to take in some of the information we've been hearing. But um, my motion would be to direct staff to express the council's interest to the, the developer in having parcels incorporated into a housing project to provide for increased affordable housing above the required 20%. I'll second that. And so, you know, this doesn't, um, you know, hinder us from moving forward with development on those lots. It meets the goals of the city. You know, I could see that it would meet the goals of the developers and it would provide us with an opportunity for a conversation on, you know, how we could meet the needs of the also do what's intended under the California Surplus Land Act, which is to really try to provide for more affordable housing in our community. Council Member Goltz, we have a motion on the floor to direct staff to work with the developer of the hotel and have them I'm sorry, I'm trying to understand the motion. So it's to direct staff to express the council's interest to the developer to have these parcels incorporated into a housing project to provide for increased affordable housing above the required 20%. Is that the 20% of the of our inclusionary ordinance? I don't That's, know what the 20% refers to. Our, our current inclusionary ordinance requires 20% affordability to be built into housing projects. And so you want it above that. Okay, and we have a second to that. Um, I'll go to Council Member Golder and then Council Member Colin Parry Johnson. I just want to remind everybody we're running about a half an hour late. I was prepared to make a motion for um, the resolution as it's written in our agenda packet, but I have some questions and a couple of comments now. And so I'd, I'd like to hear staff's response to um, this idea by Council Member Cummings because my understanding was that the developer was interested in developing a hotel, not interested in developing low-income housing. And, um, and, and I wanna know what properties they already own that are adjacent to these, I guess. Maybe you could just re refresh my memory on that. And then I would also like to remind
my um, my colleague back in 2013, the Public Safety Task Force, or 2013 did an uh, extensive year-long study, and one of the recommendations was to increase the number of hotels, high-end hotels, and, and as a way to increase transient occupancy to add to the general fund and, um, you know, encourage some of the lower um, priced hotels to maybe turn over in um, re, uh, redevelop those as potential housing. And so I know Councilmember Kamek, you mentioned Lava Heat, and I just, I know it was affordable, but I think it was affordable because it had so much deferred maintenance that it's that that, that building had to go. So, you know, buildings have a lifespan and they change over time. And I think that this, that area of um, downtown really is in desperate need of some redevelopment. And I think we are at a, we have a great opportunity here. Um, and it would be great if every parcel had affordable housing, but I think what makes downtown vibrant and what not, um, you know, like, I don't know how to, to describe it, but what you want is a mix. Well, what, 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 I, what I think we want is a mix of retail, office buildings, affordable market rate housing where people can live and work together in a central location. And I think that contributes to our, you know, vibrant economy thriving downtown. So for me, the idea of this hotel is really exciting. And um, I, 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 I think um, Bonnie's presentation made total sense explaining why um, we should move forward with it as it's presented in the packet. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kontari John. Yeah, thank you. Um, Council Member Scolder sort of asked some of the questions that are running through my head is, um, it, it, I, what I heard from Bonnie is that we, um, we have talked to the developers about the possibility of affordable housing and there isn't interest there, but please correct me if I heard incorrectly. Um, and I'm also just curious about um, above the 20%, um, is, has there been any research or investigation if that's feasible, if developers could even do that, um, build affordable housing, whether it's on this um, parcel or not, beyond 20%? I, I'm, I truly am curious to see if that, um, and, and I don't expect an answer right now, but um, it cannot be done here in our community given the cost of a building. Um, and uh, not to put you on the spot, but I would be curious to hear from Vice Mayor Brenner as well, given your extensive knowledge and experience in downtown and, and sort of downtown revitalization. Um, because I hear some of uh, Council Member Golder's points is that a, a mix of um, uh, different types of services and housing and venues is what makes a vibrant downtown. Um, and I'm certainly no expert in that area. I'd be curious if, if Vice Mayor Brenner has any thoughts on that to hear your thoughts. So thank you. I don't know if Vice Mayor would want to jump in on this. Um, you're, well, you're welcome sure. to, if you'd like, yeah. So um, I think, thank you, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and thank you, Bonnie, for uh, the presentation. I know that we've received um, concerns, especially after some of the information that was published in the Sentinel that didn't match the staff report. Um, so it was a little confusing. And my understanding with this is we are not deciding to sell for, to a hotel a, these parcels. Um, we do have due diligence to really make sure that any city-owned land um, is, uh, you know, we are in a housing crisis and um, any opportunity to build housing to add to our housing stock is crucial. And uh, in, you know, looking at these individual parcels, um, 
in and of themselves, it would be very difficult, is my understanding, not just from staff, but speaking to other people. Um, just these parcels alone, without the middle pieces that are owned by someone else, um, just the parcels we own would be very difficult to build housing and infeasible with the fund all the requirements that go along with funding for affordable housing. So unless the, the, the land in the middle, um, um, you know, that's up to them and sure we can give incentives. Um, we could certainly explore those options and we're not here to decide or sell to a hotel right here today. Um, is my understanding that we're looking at these parcels as surplus uh, declaration and as Bonnie mentioned I think a really key point that I came to understand is we don't have to decide to even sell um, the parcels so that can be our ongoing further conversation to and 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 knowing that the next steps are the 60 days out uh, there might be some uh, responses for from the Parks and Rec County and, uh, you know, open spaces, which should be interesting to see if we were to go that path. That being said, that's what we're deciding today. I think there's value in the conversation overall in looking at the best use of space as always. And as always, I'm always looking at the whole picture just a one-off situation here. Looking at the whole picture, Bonnie brought in part of the whole picture in, in terms of showing Pacific Station North and Pacific Station South and the Maple Street Paseo um, leading from Pacific Avenue to the riverfront. Um, but it's a much bigger picture than that if you take an even you know, out. We have the Front Street, Laurel, Pacific, um, development going there. We have, you know, the the other two developments going further north on Front uh, Front Street um, to the river, and they all have affordable housing and housing <coughs> getting added to our stock. And so, knowing that in the sure, you know, for years. Um, so many residents and businesses um, have really yearned for a hotel downtown. They're all in the beach area, they're all in other locations in the city, and most city centers will have hotels in their downtown district. And, um, um, you know, there is one, the Pacific Blue Inn is on South Pacific, um, on um, you know, near the 555 Pacific building there, um, <clears throat> which is technically outside of the downtown district. Um, but having a hotel downtown and increasing that <clears throat> beach to downtown uh, connection um, is really part of a bigger sustainable plan that we could certainly continue having that conversation. Um, I think it's really, um, you know, it was touched on in terms of the vibrancy and the economic um, uh, sustainability of that possibility. Um, it could really bring a lot to our downtown district. Um, and so, I mean, that's something we, we certainly should have that conversation. But here today, this item is about two individual parcels and um, um, we're not talking about selling them. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Calendari Johnson. Um, yeah, I, I, it's so important to look at the big picture of the downtown district right now and all, you know, the, the, the Calvary Church, the, all, there's like five different um, affordable low income, 25% permanent supportive housing, units all coming in all right there and so having you know um i'm so excited having uh community health centers dientes the metro the offices the the businesses the restaurants the the library just having this vibrant city center um yes a hotel could be a great addition downtown there is none but that's a further that's a different conversation you. 
Casey Vice Mayor. Um, yeah, we're we're running very late now, and I'd like to um, just go ahead and get a vote on this. On the, do you have additional comments, um, Council Member Cummings? Um, go ahead, please. Thank you. You know, I, I did, and I just wanted to be clear that you know I don't think there's a problem with us having hotels downtown. You know, for having a hotel downtown, a hotel downtown. I think that you know if that's something that you know private developers would be interested in. You know, I don't think that this, you know, we're in a position to really argue with whether that would be good or bad for the downtown. I think the issue is that we're going to sell city property in order for that to happen. And that, that if there were private property that were owned on any of these sites, for example, across the street at where the um, Pacific and Laurel project is about to go in, if that were slated for a hotel, if that was private property, they can make that decision. But what we're considering right now is selling public property for the purposes of a private business. And I think that many people in our community um, express the need that for public property, if we're gonna develop it, we need it to be affordable housing and we need more affordable housing. I think we all ran on a platform of saying that we want to provide more affordable housing in our communities. And if we're using public lands, that's the issue is that the public is really upset with us selling their land for the production of um, what will be a private luxury hotel. Again, there's three hotels under construction, um, and, we need I, and I, I'll just, no, I'll just, I'll, I'll finish with topic, I'll, which is the surplus yeah. question today. Not, yeah. we're not, we're not talking about hotel development, and you know, we're we're getting off of. I'm just trying to get us on the agenda item itself, which is and then, a resolution to to go ahead and put it out as on surplus. Well, then I'll make my, I'll make my last statement, which is, you know, and this is the agenda report, which is if the council approves the proposed resolution, city staff will send written notification to the above entities to begin noticing the process for the availability of the declared exempt parcels for purchase at fair market value. And so, you know, I just want to put that out there is that we're putting this up to the public, to these entities, the parks. We're selling this at fair market value, which means it'll come back. And um, and I imagine that the developers are going to be interested in, in wanting to purchase this land. So, um, and the, the only thing that I'm trying to get yeah. move forward with this motion is that we're, we are- We're very late, uh, council member. I know, we're just, very late, we're very late. I mean, we- Order, can I ask a point of order? Um, can, sure. Are council Absolutely. members allowed to complete their comments are being interrupted that aren't agendized right now we're we're tr trying to get us to focus on the agendized item i'm happy to continue but we're debating housing versus affordable now we're talking about housing or hotels that are being built in beach in the, down in the beach area so we've kind of gone out of a little bit out of the agenda item and i'm just trying to make sure that we're focused on the agenda item which is a request to issue a resolution to basically, um, you know, list these as exempt surplus property. I'm, I'm just trying, it's my job to try to make sure that we're staying on the agenda items. That's all I'm doing. So go ahead. Understood, Council. Mayor. I just have to say the agenda report is clearly tailored to a proposal for a hotel. So just because that's not the vote that we are taking today, that is part of the conversation. It, hey, just, it is. Council Member Cummings, did you have additional comments? Um, no, I'll end it there. It's just in the interest of time. So there's a motion on the floor and it's the purpose is for, for trying to engage with the developer around rather than a hotel having housing. And so I'll leave my comments there. So I'll go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and um, I will take a vote on this motion um, and then um, we'll have to, uh, depending on the outcome of this motion, we'll revisit. Um, Bonnie, did you have any other comments that you wanted to make? I saw you sort of. Well, there were a number of questions that uh, Council Member Commissary Johnson um, brought up and Council Member Boulder brought up that mm -hmm. I could respond to, but if you want to wait, um, I can do that as well. Go ahead, yeah, so we can go ahead and finish, yeah. Okay. Um, there was a question about for the privately owned parcels, how many there are four, and they were assembled expressly for the purposes of developing a hotel project. Um, so they did approach the city. Our early conversations were there's a process, 
And um, because of the Surplus Lands Act, and this is in the coastal zone, these are the steps. So um, just backing up, that's why we came to closed session earlier to see if there was interest in at least doing the initial steps so that we could have that conversation down the road of whether or not you wanted to sell and what kind of public benefits we could receive um, in um, exchange of selling this land for a hotel project. So we did talk about, uh, you know, funding, and this is, you know, for future conversation of, uh, you know, going towards the affordable housing trust fund or leverage benefits. All those are things that I think are really viable and will actually get us more affordable housing than trying to develop these individual parcels, which just are not suited on their own for affordable housing development. So can we leverage uh, the sale of these into more funding for affordable housing? Absolutely. And we can do that a couple of ways. We can do that from for the parcels, but we can also do that uh, if that's council's direction um, through uh, the fact that we're going to be receiving fairly substantial TOT. This hotel has proposed 228 units. So TOT from that could be, you know, upwards of 101, you know, 1.5 to 2 million a year coming to the city. And if you wanted to designate that, which I would love a portion of that uh, to affordable housing creation, that could be our ongoing revenue stream for affordable housing creation that we can leverage to create more affordable housing in our community. That's how we got the PAC Station South, PAC Station North um, projects going forward is leveraging our affordable housing trust fund. So I'm all for having this discussion where it makes sense of uh, let's strategically plan for more affordable housing in our community. So I, I'm excited to continue that conversation uh, down the road. Um, is the question about interest by the developer and affordable housing? You know, I'll back up and say the LLC, my understanding, the makeup of that is, li is the main equity partner is a hotel developer. Um, so uh, they're not in the business of developing housing. Um, the question is um, came up around uh, a market rate project with 20% or over 20% feasible without, and I think this is where you may have been going, Council Member Cummings, the donation of the land. You know, we'd have to rerun, um, you know, a performa to see if that donation of land leverages enough for them to go above that feasibility. We just don't know at this point, um, but typically. Uh, our last analysis is 20% is not affordable on a market rate unless there's some additional concessions made. So we would have to run that math if, if the addition of this land, a portion of it in the South, which just is not developable, you know, how much they could actually leverage. So I can't answer that today, um, but that is something that we could look at. Um, if it were slated for 100% affordable, yes, because there's different funding sources available than there would be to market rate uh, develop, developers. Um, however, for, uh, you know, it's that fine line, if you're looking at a market project that are inclusionary, you just can't get really above 15% without some major incentives or concessions financially. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, and there's a special developer that develops affordable housing. Your typical market rate developers do not do affordable housing because the financing for that is so complicated that it takes a lot of expertise and years of experience to successfully develop large affordable housing projects. And if we were looking at all the private four parcels plus two city parcels, that would be considered a large scale affordable housing project, which would be a very uh, unique set of uh, developers of which we do have in the community. Um, but the primary and largest part of, the, of this parcel, uh, of these parcels are privately owned and the interest is from a hotel developer at this point. So I think that largely answers the, the questions that came up, but to address those um, further if needed. Are there any other questions or comments from council for of staff or comments about, about the action today? I did not mean to cut off conversation, but I am um, trying to am trying to move us through our, our agenda. So, um, okay, we have a motion on the floor. Bonnie, can you put that motion back up just so I can make sure the language right? Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, by council member Cummings, seconded by council member Brown to direct staff to express the council's interest to the developer in having these parcels incorporated into a housing project to, for increased affordable housing above the required 20%. So um, Bonnie, I'll go ahead and uh, request a roll call vote, please. 
Council Member Watkins is absent. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. No. Vice Mayor Bruner? No. And Mayor Myers? No. That motion fails uh, with four voting against and two voting for. So um, I know this is an important item, I believe, that you would probably like action on. So I'll look for uh, a uh, seat council member Gold or see if I can get a motion uh, regarding uh, this item. Council member uh, Golder and then uh, Vice Mayor Bruno. Okay, uh, I'd like to make a motion declaring the two non-contiguous parcels designated in the record of the Santa Cruz County Assessor's APPN 005-151-48. Um, and APN 005-15135 um, as exempt surplus property pursuant to the Surplus Lands Act. That's a motion um, regarding the, the resolution um, for these two parcels. And Vice Mayor Bruner, did you want to second that? I second that. Great, thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote, please, Bonnie. Councilmember Watkins is absent. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? No. Cummings? No. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes uh, with four votes in favor and so we next up um we will go ahead and move on to our public hearing um and i just want to announce that uh item number 19 will not be heard today uh it has been continued to the june 8th meeting and um if you are interested in the draft ordinance uh, for the first reading on May 11th, 2021. That can be found online at www.cityofsantacruz.com slash government slash city council slash publication of ordinances. And that is published, that link is published in the agenda for today. Next up, we'll have um, item number 20. Uh, and if possible, I think we could all take a five minute, minute seven to eight minute break. Um, I know some of us probably use the restroom and stretch our legs. So we will come back at um, 2.50, 250 if we can, 2.50, 2.52. Thank you, everybody. Welcome back, Vice Mayor. Um, if council member Golder is coming in here. Okay, I've got every um, everybody's back. Thank you everybody for coming in back on time. We'll go ahead and move on to our uh, item number 20. Um, this is a resolution amending the city of Santa Cruz personnel classification and compensation plan for the city manager classification. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions. 
The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, so we will invite, I'll invite up uh, Lisa Murphy, our human resources director to provide a short, um, short presentation. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. The item before you is a resolution to amend the classification and compensation plan for the city manager classification. Uh, as you all know, the city manager will be retiring in August and in preparation for the city manager recruitment, we conducted a total compensation analysis. The position has not been reviewed in nearly 14 years since 2007. And this um, analysis revealed that the position is approximately 26% below market. There's a number of things that contributed to that factor. And the reason why we're having this discussion is because as we enter into this uh, recruitment, uh, it's very highly competitive and to, to remain uh, competitive with the other recruitments, we that are uh, adjusting the compensation for the city manager position. So just a brief background on how we got so off in the market. Uh, in 2015 and 2018, uh, we had a compensation study where we were able to adjust uh, 80 positions um, throughout the city uh, to bring them within 10% of the median, but we did not adjust the city manager's position. Uh, in addition, the current city manager, Martin Bernal, he voluntarily deferred COLAs since 2017, which was about 9%. Again, uh, without adjusting the uh, salary range has again led to further below market. Um, in addition, we have a three-tier retirement system, unlike most cities. Any new city manager coming this, a highly experienced city manager will most likely be in what's called the classic tier. We will not offer that tier to that individual, which uh, then becomes a, a, an issue for a lower retirement benefit for um, in this position and pushes us back further in the market. Uh, these factors have led to a, a significantly falling behind of the generally accepted 10% within market. Uh, the additional information with this is that this has also led to significant compaction between uh, the positions of our police chief, our fire chief, and the assistant city manager, where the difference in salaries is just 11%. And generally accepted standard is 15 to 20%. And we, we try to implement that throughout the city's compensation system. Uh, therefore, in order to attract the highly uh, qualified candidates to apply, uh, staff is recommending that we increase the salary range to bring it closer to market uh, increasing the range uh, an additional 10%. In addition, uh, we recommend lowering the employee contribution to the per the employee per portion from 12% to 10%, uh, and hoping that this will again attract more candidates. And with this change, and also I apologize, a contribution to a deferred comp uh, program. All of these these three adjustments. With, uh, would bring the city manager's position within 10% of the market. And the market I'm referring to are the, the uh, cities that the uh, city of Santa Cruz has used in the past two compensation uh, surveys. Uh, so therefore, we believe that it, there's validity in the, in the research that we've conducted. So with that, uh, my brief presentation has concluded. And my recommendation to the council is to increase the, the for the new city manager, this will not be for the existing city manager. Uh, again, the new one uh, when this person uh, hopefully takes over in late August. Uh, if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to uh, respond. Great, thank you, Lisa. Are there any questions from council on this? Uh, council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I um, am wondering if I, somehow I'm, I'm just not clear, is, is this increase budgeted in the draft budget that we have received that we're gonna be discussing later and over the next few weeks roughly? Is it in the budget now? And um, if it's not, um, or if it is, 
not really more. If it's not, um, is there, where, where is the discussion on where that money is going to come from? We, we generally, whenever we are asked to make, to increase uh, an expense, we're told it needs to come from somewhere else. So I'm just wondering what the thinking is there, um, if it's budgeted and where the money will come from. It will be incorporated into this budget and it is through the general fund. And a couple of things that add to that is that the city manager is not, we budget the city manager's position at top step. Uh, he's not receiving top step. And, and also in addition, whoever comes in will be in a lower tier for their benefit program. So that lowers the amount that the city has to contribute, which will offset the increased cost of this as well. Are there any other questions from the city council on this item? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. I'll go ahead and take it out to the public. This is for item number 20 on our agenda, which is a resolution amending the city of Santa Cruz personnel classification and compensation plan for the city manager classification. I'm not seeing any hands in the public. So I will go ahead and bring this back for council for a motion from our council and uh, look for a, for a council member who would be willing to make that motion unless there's further comments. Vice Mayor Bruner and then uh, council member Colin Tari Johnson. Oh, you're muted, um, Vice Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, after receiving all the information, and really I want to thank uh, Lisa Murphy for breaking everything down into comparables and background and historical context and, and understanding how far behind um, we've landed this position though it sounds like a lot of money and it is a lot of money. Um, I hope that we can implement going forward where um, we don't fall so far behind, but um, I would like to make a motion, a resolution amending the classification and compensation plan for the city manager classification. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And uh, Council Member Colantari Johnson? Yeah, and and also just want to thank Lisa and um, the team working with Lisa and the community for uh, participating in the community surveys that help us uh, define uh, the characteristics and who we're looking for as our new city manager. Thank you, council member. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Bruner, uh, a second by council member Contrary Johnson uh, for uh, the resolution amending the city of Santa Cruz personnel classification and compensation plan for the city manager classification. And I will go ahead and ask for a roll call. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, council member Brown. Thank you, just a quick comment, uh, just for members of the public who are paying attention to this, I just wanna say that we're making a decision here to increase uh, the top paid position at the city by um, probably around $3,000 a month, which is equivalent to, or maybe a little bit less than what many of our workers make a year. So the raise itself is gonna be, um, you know, and if you're a part-time or temporary worker, um, less. <laughs> so I just want to understand that when we're making this decision, I recognize the um, lagging behind uh, the market. And um, I hope that uh, my colleagues will remember this when we talk about other positions. It seems to be that when the top paid positions come up for discussion, um, we do um, you know where the money is going to come from, the need for it to, to be competitive. But when we talk about virtually every other classification of worker at the city, we don't follow that same um, approach. So I just wanted to have a chance to say that before um, before the roll call. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, please, uh, could the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Watkins is absent. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? No. Coming? No, and I'd just like to say for the record that I do understand um, trying to recruit um, 
high-level candidates. There have been members of the public reaching out to us, especially given that we've had furloughs and um, and many people have been expressing that um, they are not in favor of this at this moment in time. And so I'm just reflecting and respecting the comments that we've received from the general public on this item. Um, Boulder? Hey, and did we go to the public on this? I forgot if we go to public comment. Okay, sorry, I'm losing my. <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes four in favor and two against. Okay, uh, we will now move on to, to item number 21 on our general business um, agenda today. And this is um, the local roadway safety plan. And um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the city council for deliberation and action. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite our presenter today, Claire Gallagly, um, our transportation planner with our public works department. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, recognizing that you have a packed day today, I'm gonna try to keep this presentation uh, quick and to the point. I, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're really excited to give you this presentation today on our local roadway safety plan. Um, overall, what we're going to go through is the vision and goals for the plan, an analysis of the results, a highlight of the emphasis areas that this plan will focus on, and some key next step actions that we're going to be taking. Um, we did, as we went through this project, I want to highlight that we worked with a consulting team from Kinley Horn. This was a grant-funded project. Um, and we also engaged directly with the fire department, public health department, metro, um, county, and um, our subcommittee of the Transportation Public Works Commission and folks from the University of California, Santa Cruz. So why did we undertake a local roadway safety plan? Uh, you may remember, those of you that were on council at the time, in August of 2019, Council directed us to work on Vision Zero. Um, specifically, what's on the screen right now, Council directed that we adopt the Vision Zero policy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and serious injuries by 2030. There are task force to focus on this. And then finally, in bold here, to gather, analyze, utilize, and share reliable data to understand traffic safety issues, to prioritize resources based on evidence of the greatest need and impact, and to evaluate the success of those efforts. So this item before you is really focusing on that. The local roadway safety plan is a deep dive into our traffic safety data over the past five years with an analysis of where we see the greatest need and a projection of what the greatest impact um, solutions could be to that. And then an ongoing analysis of what, what other tools we could use. So the local roadway safety plan is one of the tools that we are using towards implementing Vision Zero. It is not the only tool, but it is a key data pillar of those efforts. We also focus on education, encouragement, enforcement, equity, evaluation, and all the other E's that we use in traffic safety. Really, it's looking at systematically our entire city, identifying and analyzing where our traffic safety problems are. Oftentimes, we get collision reports at the location here, a location there but taking the time to do a deep dive of five years worth and see what trends we've been seeing and what countermeasures we can put in place to address those trends and make our roadways safe for all roadway users. Um, we really took it, uh, the time to focus on our local partnerships within the city. So in the department, so we worked a lot with police and fire and have stronger work, working relationships there as well as public health and external transportation partners as well. We really wanted to develop a of what we could use to address um, issues that we saw on the roadways. And a key component here was that we looked at where the locations were hotspots, but we also looked at systematic improvements that we could make that addressed trends we saw in collisions citywide. So even if it was a hotspot here, you might have similar collision characteristics in another location and similar countermeasures could be applied there. Uh, we really wanted to be proactive. So looking at what could we do to address these to make them better in the future. And then finally, a key thing here, knowing that we focus on funding a lot, and in my department, um, we spend a lot of time doing grant writing, 
Having an adopted local roadway safety plan will be required to access grant funding through the Highway Safety Improvement Program starting in the next cycle. Um, the name of a misnomer, Highway Safety Improvement Program, we use this for bike and pedestrian projects primarily as well as other roadway safety projects. This program has funded sidewalks on Bay Street, a protected left turn at Bay and King to enhance uh, bike head safety. And uh, just a couple months ago, we got about $1.5 million from this program for two projects. One to improve six pedestrian crossings in the city and the other to improve our signal citywide to enhance roadway safety to reduce rear end collisions and right angle collisions. So really important that we have an adopted plan so that we can continue to access that fund source. Getting into the vision and goals of this document, really the primary vision there was focusing on complete streets to meet and exceed our vision zero goal. How can we really incorporate safety into every action that we take in transportation? Uh, we broke this down into a couple key goals, identifying areas with the highest risk for collisions. So where can we really focus to make a, a big impact on collisions? Developing a comprehensive safety program and supporting systemic process. So how do we look at the roadways holistically react to locations that we see collisions, but proactively plan for how we can improve our roadway system to prevent them from happening. Um, really looking at future safety improvements that improve multimodal options, so not just focusing on safety improvements for cars, but as we're making safety improvements, how do we ensure that those safety improvements also support those in taking transit in other modes? Um, and finally, define some safety projects for future HSEP and other program funding considerations. So getting a couple key projects that are very, very fundable. And so working with Kimley Horn, they do a lot of work in this area as well, um, looking at how do we have something in the queue that we can start applying for that would be very good grant applications and make a big safety impact. I'm gonna say safety a lot in this presentation because that's kind of the, the thesis of what you should take from this. Um, looking at an analysis of results, so we, we looked at data from 2015 to 2019. Um, over that 100, we had 2,496 collisions. Most of them, as you can see, were on our arterials, and about 18% of them included a cyclist or a pedestrian. Traffic safety uh, collision rankings, in, in some ways, to analyze how we're doing compared to similar size cities. You all frequently hear that we rank very, very poorly in terms of our rankings for cyclists. Typically, we're between the number one and number three um, for cities our size. Um, we have been, something to note, we have been improving in our rankings. This is 2017 and 2018 side by side. In most of the areas that we look at, we have been improving. The exception to that is that we have not been improving in uh, DUI-related collisions, and that's something that we've, we've flagged in discussions with the police department as well. Some key takeaways from the report, and keeping this really high level, is that a third of our collisions have an unknown primary collision factor. When an officer shows up, it's unable to be determined what was the primary cause of that collision. But um, other things that are high primary collision factors are improper turning, unsafe speed, and an auto right away violation. So an automobile moving in a way that they, they were not supposed to. Um, again, to note that many, many of the collision factors have remained constant or decreased, but driving under influence has been steadily increasing from 15 collisions in 2015 up to 26 in 2019, which is you know doubling over this time period. So it's something that the police department, when, when we discuss this with them, they're gonna be including target DUI enforcement in their next OTS enforcement grant. So to be able to specifically address that as a result of this data deep dive. Um, a key highlight here is that in 2019, 0.5% of all collisions were fatal. 0.34 were severe. So key thing to note here is that while any collisions that are fatal and severe are too high, we are moving in the right direction of reducing fatalities and severe injuries. Uh, there is more work to be done, but it does help us to acknowledge this and track our progress. Um, and then finally, again, to reiterate that 18% of the total collisions that we saw in this five-year period, bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, as we know, cyclists and pedestrians, when they are involved in a collision, because they're not protected by a vehicle, those collisions are more likely to be fatal and severe. Other things, over 90% of our collisions occur within 250 feet of an intersection. This really helps us in looking at this to dive into where can we make sure that we're making safety improvements? Where can we focus our efforts 
and what future policy and engineering actions can we bring to you to continue to improve roadway safety at our intersections? You may have seen our recent Street Smarts ads that we've put out, but one of the key topics that we're focusing on this year is intersection safety. Janice Fisco in our office has really been working on promoting that message. Um, we also have a lot of rear end and side swipe collisions and hit object. Um, of some of the, the major reasons that we have for uh, collisions that occur that I really want to highlight is aggressive driving. So aggressive driving collisions make up 18% of all collisions in the city. Um, aggressive driving includes speeding. And of this 18%, 77% of those were speed related. It's been a kind of hot topic to talk about speeding is included in aggressive driving. And the big reason behind that is because it is defined that way in the strategic highway safety plan, which is the Caltrans planning document and the fund source that funded this grant. So we really match up our local roadway safety plan to what those Caltrans terms are, because then in turn, when we go seek funding from Caltrans, matching up to their key challenge areas of which aggressive driving is one, makes the improvements that we seek that much more fundable. So keeping um, speeding under aggressive driving, that's like the primary driver there. Finally, getting to our emphasis areas and key next step actions that we're gonna be looking at. Um, improving visibility and lighting for all modes. What we found was that uh, a higher than normal rate of collisions were occurring at night. And so one of the next step actions that we're going to take is to do a citywide lighting assessment to look and see, are there easy tools that we could put in place with the system that we have citywide that would address this and could, could minimize that 38% of collisions that occur during non-daylight hours. Um, the next one is reduce aggressive driving behavior. Speeding is definitely one of the elements that we will focus on here because it's the largest portion of aggressive driving, but other components there as well. And finally, improving traffic safety for all our vulnerable roadway users, which are typically considered cyclists and pedestrians. But then also house population. It's been a population that's been really hard to reach. It's a population who is often involved with um, some of our, our fatal and severe injury collisions, especially around our high volume roadways. And so we have a key recommendation in here to continue to work with our public health department to do targeted outreach to our unhoused population to focus on roadway safety. Next steps that we will be undertaking is initiating the ongoing Vision Zero Task Force. This will be a multidisciplinary team that we'll put together to quarterly review our roadway safety data and, and make recommendations towards continued implementation of this plan. Um, if you may remember from the second slide, that was one of the recommendations that council made. So now that we have the baseline data, we'll be, we'll be jumping off on that. Um, to continue to work through the implementation of best practices that are included in this plan and implement many of the recommendations that are there, to continue to pursue HSIP and other grant funds to make these targeted improvements for my safety, uh, to continue to work on incorporating these best practices and our, our high value safety improvements into planning studies and also implementation of other projects, and to continually be assessing opportunities and think about how we can continue to do things better and be open to new information. So with that, thank you so much. I'm available for any questions and my email address is on the screen also if you wanna follow up with anything offline. Thank you very much, Claire. Appreciate the, um, the the presentation and yeah, just a lot of really great work. Um, I will go ahead and open it up to see if council members have questions. Done? Council member Cummings. Thank you for the presentation, Claire. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, just actually one of them just slipped my mind, but. Um, in particular, you know, as you know, this, the implementation of this report moves forward, I guess what's the best way for uh, community members to kind of you know, reach out to staff for work in terms of being able to bring their, their concerns with their streets forward? I know, for example, Almar Street, um, there's often speeding and people complain all the time about how much speeding happens on that street in particular. And obviously down in the beach area, there's also of speeding down here on Beach Street and some of the other streets. And so in order for people to kind of understand how the city is going to prioritize dealing with that and, and what options are there, what's the best way for people to be able to um, engage with the city to get these concerns met? Yeah, 
Yeah, I would say a two-pronged approach. If it's a specific concern that you have of speeding on my street between here and there, using our community request for portal crisp is really, really helpful because it allows us to continually track that. It does get routed to us and we, we um, partner with the police department on that on doing speed enforcement as well. If it is more holistic ideas or um, things that you'd like to discuss, you're always welcome to contact me. Um, probably here at pretty accessible so feel free to reach out or call me and i will get back to you <coughs> and we can continue working on moving things forward just big plug for the community request for service portal as well thank you next i have vice mayor bruner and then um council member colin tar johnson i um, it's been answered i was going to plug crisp i use it almost every day the community request for service portal it would be under traffic concern and i just directed a constituent to report um they were interested in lights on the cross by their house they have a lot of seniors in the area and cars driving by and not slowing down for the crosswalk and so um I know it's on the city of Santa Cruz website. It's also a free app. Um, and, you know, bike or pedestrian hazards can be reported through there. Um, syringes can be reported through there. Um, graffiti, <laughs> sewer spills, backup, et cetera. But yeah, <laughs> thanks, Claire, for bringing that up. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. Next is uh, Councilmember Condary Johnson and then Councilmember Brown. Thank you so much for the presentation and all the amazing work. Um, when it's appropriate and you have more information, I'd love to understand the strategies and how um, how uh, the specifically reduced aggressive driving, improved traffic safety for vulnerable roadway users, including the unhoused, how those will be operationalized. Um, when there's more information, I'd love to learn that. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the, the report and all of your efforts to um, squeeze a lot of in a short presentation on a 100-page plan that has been a long time in the making. I really appreciate it. Um, I am um, just wondering if, um, if you could talk about um, because as some of our, um, some of our uh, correspondents have suggested, um, this is this is certainly part of our overall effort to achieve Vision Zero, and 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 I think that using this as a tool is um, is really um, is a great start. And so I'm just wondering if um, like how you're thinking about using it um, in terms of operationalizing, making decisions, prioritizing, and what role, if any, would the Transportation and Public Works Commission play in that? I know they have a lot of ideas and um you know yeah. a lot of, of of expertise in this area and so they, they fit in as well absolutely so the transportation public works currently have transportation public works commission currently has a standing subcommittee to focus on vision zero so as we assemble our vision zero task force that will be multidisciplinary we will also have those subcommittee members participating in that so there'll be direct engagement there as well as continuous reports back to the Transportation Public Works Commission. Um, I do want to reiterate that yes, this is one component of our Vision Zero framework, and it's an important one. It's the data component that says, these are the fact patterns that we have there. We may also have feelings, we may also have thoughts, we may also have beliefs that go into the whole Vision Zero process and framework, but always remembering to center back on what, what is the collision pattern that we see? Where can we make an impact? And where should we immediately be looking to make an impact based on countermeasures that we know will help improve roadway safety? And so making sure that we have those community conversations and continue to carry that forward as we continue to implement, I wanna emphasize also Vision Zero is a program. It's not gonna be a project, it's not going to end. It is an ongoing program that is gonna be an iterative process. And so as we move through that, uh, making sure that we do focus on we do also focus on experiences and enforcement and equity and education and all of the other components that will make it well-rounded and really be able to reach more broadly into the community than just kind of the transportation gearheads that, that we work with a lot. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good Very term, a gearhead. Um, I have a question, um, Claire, that came in a, came in a, um, an email to us 
it's regarding kind of the whole approach to lighting and um, sort of, you know, bright lights versus, you know, lights that really kind of really provide more of that ground-based, you know, ability to kind of see. And I know when I'm riding my bike at night, you know, yeah, you get those experiences where you're blinded by, you know, headlights or whatever. It's a little just it, that's all part of this planning work, right, is to kind of look at these different approaches to lighting. Um, okay. Right. And it depends on where you are. You know, if you're on our river walk on an off street path where you're only oriented the lighting towards cyclists and pedestrians, it is a lower, more human scale lighting. If you're on a high volume roadway where the majority of people who are on that roadway are motorists, it's a higher level street light to more broadly illuminate where the runway is. So really context sensitive solutions there, they are appropriate to the user group that we would see. Okay, so that will all be part of kind of wrapped into this is not just, you know, facilities and safety and all that, but this, but really that infrastructure of, of how you stay safe even at yeah. night. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and take this out to the public and see if we have anyone in the public that may want to comment on this. I am not seeing any hands. Um, so I would go ahead and bring this back to council and I see council member Golder has her hand up. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the local roadway safety plan and of the commitment of the City of Santa Cruz in pursuing Vision Zero. And I see uh, Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson has her hand up. Yeah, I'll second. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the great um, uh, presentation, Claire, and all your work. Um, I will go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. Okay, Councilmember Watkins is absent. Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thanks, all. Thank you, Claire. Uh, we'll now move on to oral communications. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required that you state your name. Um, please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. Okay, so I will look um, to any members of the public today who would like to address us. Um, these are, this will be for items not on the agenda. And I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so we will go ahead then uh, and move on to our presentations for our afternoon session. Um, and next up is item is on our, I, excuse me, next up on our agenda is item number 22, fiscal year 2022 proposed budget. This is part one of the city's budget presentations. We will receive presentations from additional depart, from some departments today. We'll resume at 9 a.m. tomorrow for the remaining department presentations. At the end of today's presentations, I will call for public comment on all the departments who have presented today. I will call on the city manager to get us started. Martin, uh, Martin Bernal will speak and then he will call on finance director Kim Kraus. Uh, and then I will call on each to give their presentation from here on out. Um, and we will maybe take a short break in about uh, maybe about a half an hour. 
maybe about uh, maybe about an hour, maybe right before the uh, water director um, water department presentation. We'll just take a um, a ten minute break to just stretch our legs, ten to fifteen minutes. We'll see how things are going. Uh, so go ahead and uh, let's. Um, so I'll turn this over to Martine Bernal, our city manager. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. We do have a PowerPoint uh, presentation to go over with you. Um, I'll ask uh, Kim to, to put that up. And uh, Kim and I are going to uh, share the presentation uh, this, this afternoon. And this is the, uh, the start of the budget hearings, which will start this, this afternoon uh, and then continue uh, tomorrow. Uh, so the agenda will include an introduction and over, overall outlook um, a fiscal summary, uh, and then uh, uh, what happens next in terms of the process and the uh, decision making for the city council. Okay, introduction. So I'll, I'll do this portion here. Um, just wanted to start off by noting, um, reflecting a little bit on the really unprecedented uh, and unparalleled year of change that we've had uh, in the city. Um, and, and the impact to the city. Uh, not only has the uh, COVID-19 pandemic had really major effects on our fiscal position, our work, our personal lives, and uh, but also on our region uh, as we've experienced, uh, you know, the trauma of the fires um, and and the, and the impacts of all of that. And I don't think we've never really had a, a time where we've had such a. a drastic requirement to act really swiftly uh, and, and nimbly in the face of really mounting challenges. It's really been unprecedented. Uh, and the fiscal impact of the COVID-19 is really the most significant of Santa Cruz, in my opinion, even greater than the Great Recession of 2007, uh, which uh, uh, we had to make some major significant and, and difficult decisions as a result of that as well. And we have never really faced such a dramatic and drastic reduction in revenues while really at the same time having to respond to public emergencies and maintain essential services. Uh, so this, uh, this difficult balance uh, to remain fiscally solvent, but also to respond to the increasing uh, needs of the, our community. So fortunately, the city does have a strong record of prudent fiscal practices, including setting aside reserves to uh, address unforeseen uh, events and disasters as we've experienced, uh, although we've experienced more than our usual number. Um, and uh, with respect to the general fund, the city did see a significant loss of, of 10 million in fiscal year 2020 and a loss of 11 million in fiscal year 2021. Um, and uh, uh, as you'll see in a few minutes uh, with uh, our finance director's presentation, uh, we do project uh, some recovery, but also a uh, deficit, and, and she'll go into the details of that impact. Uh, it's important also to note that just as uh, uh, as important, uh, each and every city employee also stepped up to these challenges over the past year. Um, the city froze hiring, encouraged our retirements, and for uh, fiscal year 2021, most employer groups took a 10% salary reduction through furloughs. Uh, these sacrifices resulted in approximately $7 million in savings. Uh, as the effects of the pandemic continued in October, the city council adopted a re that resulted in another $5 million in cuts. Uh, most severe was the elimination of, uh, you'll recall, the city's park ranger program, which is a difficult decision to make. So we had to quickly respond and, and act to remain solvent. Uh, and even still, our general fund reserves decreased 32% from fiscal year 2019 to 20. 21. The residents, uh, community organizations, and businesses also personally felt the effects of the pandemic. Uh, in 2020, unemployment skyrocketed in the city to a high of nearly 14% and end of the year averaging about 8%, although that has improved. Uh, comparing you know, fiscal years 2019 uh, and 2021, we saw the number of business license issues uh, drop 35%. Our finance team estimates the city will experience revenue deficit of 27 million through the end of the upcoming fiscal year. So that's pretty significant. With respect to our enterprise funds, the pandemic also had an effect. Uh, one of the most significant was the parking fund. We saw a loss of 4.5 4 million as uh, parking uh, just went away. 
uh, the parking fund will, will be able to weather the loss due to prudent reserves as well, uh, as well as the ability to adjust rates and the return of parking demand in the parking district, but, but it was a challenge. Uh, of interest is that the golf course fund, which, uh, well, technically is not an enterprise fund, did experience a boom um, as a result of the pandemic, but it requires a subsidy from the general fund uh, as we had been experiencing. It was one of those uh, interesting sort of outcomes of the pandemic where more and more people did uh, activities outside and golfing was, was one of them. Uh, looking ahead to fiscal year 2020, 2022, uh, we see uh, signs that recovery has begun. Uh, we started to move to less restrictive COVID-19 tiers, as you heard about the, this, this afternoon from uh, our chief uh, and uh, economic development director, our chief and economic development director, and uh, more people are uh, getting vaccinated and it's really uh, is allowing the local economy and tourism to begin to reopen and rebound. As of March of this year, the unemployment rate in the city fell to 4.5%. And uh, in May, we lifted the city employee for almost six weeks ahead of schedule. So that has helped to also improve uh, our ability to provide services. Uh, the city also received federal relief funding. Uh, the first round, uh, which we received in December of 2020, of approximately 780,000, uh, was used to address added costs of responding to the pandemic. Uh, and I have to say it was really an inadequate uh, amount for the city uh, like us who had to respond to the impact of the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, fortunately, the city is set to receive approximately 14 million in one federal American rescue plan stimulus funds, uh, half of that this year and half of that next year uh, to help stabilize the budget. However, being one-time uh, being one-time funding, it will provide really interim stability to the city allowing the deferral of additional reductions, replenishing reserves, and essentially allowing the city the time to develop and implement a long range fiscal sustainability plan. And that's uh, what we've been working on. Uh, it will not close our significant structural deficit or fully restore the massive revenue gaps brought on by the pandemic uh, as, as that is structural. The bottom line is that the city is facing a structural budget deficit and you'll see those charts and the details of that in a few minutes. Um, so we are facing a structural deficit and it's important to recognize that. At the start of 2021, the city um, launched Revision Santa Cruz, uh, and the council adopted that, an interim recovery plan to carry us through a 12 to 18 month recovery period. The plan uh, uh, envisions executing a bold vision that centers on the priorities of long-term fiscal sustainability, which is key, downtown and business revitalization and building out infrastructure. We will explore ways to inject our, uh, our local economy with new jobs, clean businesses, affordable housing, and resilient green infrastructure. And we will bolster what makes Santa Cruz special by supporting our businesses, advocating for new and improved funding sources and reinventing in, in the downtown and infrastructure uh, for our roads, water uh, to parks, facilities and open spaces. And, and you saw uh, that uh, work already begun and is underway for many of the items that have been before you in recent months. Our focus during the 2022 budget year will, will will not only be on recovery, but also on resilience. Uh, uh, again, because of the scale of the structural deficit, the city will continue to identify areas for expenditure reductions and explore potential for a new revenue measure. Uh, as the council's aware, uh, revenue has been uh, in the process of looking at that, a poll, uh, public opinion poll has been conducted and that poll as well as the uh, recommendations from that committee will be before the council uh, in the next uh, month for uh, how to uh, proceed with uh, potentially a revenue measure. Currently, the committee is engaged in stakeholder outreach uh, to uh, uh, determine the viability of a, uh, a ballot measure to bolster uh, revenue. Without the addition of revenue sources, new revenue sources to the city, uh, we do face uh, uh, deficits uh, over, over the long term. So it is really essential to our long term uh, sustainability. And, and again, it's very important work that, that needs to be done by the city. As a city, we are limited in our ability to raise taxes. And so this is one of the ways that we have had to really uh, look at uh, historically to continue to uh, of the community uh, and uh, to respond to, to needs uh, effectively. I want to, uh, uh, before turning it back to, to our finance director, where she'll go over the, some of the details of the budget and highlights 
I want to thank uh, her, uh, Tim Krauss, and our budget manager, Lupita Alamos, for all of their hard work, and as well as the budget development team on putting the proposed budget before you. There's a lot of work that goes into uh, putting the budget together, um, and uh, it, uh, they, they deserve that recognition uh, for being able to do that. Uh, I also want to thank the executive leadership uh, team and really the more than 800 employees of the city uh, for their sacrifices this past year and the work that's been done to get us there. They really have truly demonstrated their unwavering dedication to serving our community and, and deserve recognition. Uh, so with that, um, I uh, want to uh, I now turn it over to our uh, finance director and then after she concludes, I'll uh, come back and talk about next steps. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Martine. Uh, good afternoon. Vice Mayor, members of the council, it's nice to be with you today. I'm pleased to present the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget. Uh, I would like to follow on uh, Martine's comments, recognizing people for their work that they did in this budget. Uh, first, I wanna thank the council for their commitment to fiscal sustainability and the work that you've done on the two committees that you've created to make sure we stay sustainable. I also want to thank Martine Bernal and Laura Schmidt for their guidance and leadership during this budget process. Uh, I want to acknowledge that it's Martine's last budget process and he is really going to be missed. Um, I very much appreciate his guidance and leadership and um, I need to steal his institutional memory out of his brain so that it stays here with one of us. Um, I also want to recognize the department directors, their managers, and their budget staff as they spent hundreds of hours um, not only doing this budget, but this is the third budget we've done in a fiscal year in addition to a mid-year. And uh, there were times because of the challenging fiscal situation, we, we had to change course dramatically, like when we were awarded the American Rescue Plan funding. So they did it with good cheer, and I very much appreciate um, their hard work and acknowledge it. We also changed the format of the budget document a little bit this year. We uh, changed the narrative. Um, hopefully it's more concise, and, but they also did a lot of work to help us get through that process. And last but not least, I wanna recognize the finance staff who worked on this budget. Uh, Lupita Alamos, if you would turn on your camera. I would like to thank you and recognize you for uh, the hard work you did leading all these budget processes in the last year. Uh, on her team is Tracy Cole and Jillian Morales. I want to thank them too and recognize them for their dedication and hard work. Uh, they all worked uh, many nights and weekends, even though uh, staff were on furlough. So I very much appreciate that. And two more uh, finance team members to recognize um, for their work on the capital improvement budget, and that's Nick Gong and Edward Torres. So to everyone who put so much time and a little bit of love into this budget. So I'm gonna go over kind of the fiscal summary. We'll spend most of our time talking about the general fund, but I have a little bit um, to say about uh, some of the other funds. So Martine covered this a little bit, our actions that we've taken to date to maintain uh, the general fund. Uh, we implemented a hiring freeze. Uh, we had the furloughs or other cost savings agreements with each of the bargaining units uh, that saved the city about four and a half million dollars. Uh, we offered the early retirement incentive that netted about $1.4 million. Uh, we used reserves, we drew down on the general fund reserves as well as the workers' comp reserves, and we stopped the transfer to the Economic Development Trust uh, for one year. Uh, we implemented about 5.3 million in budget reductions in the fiscal year 2021 budget. We offered employees a voluntary time off policy. Uh, we deferred um, any general fund support to capital improvement projects. We've continued to pursue FEMA reimbursements and federal and state aid. Uh, you know, the claims we have going are the CZU fire and the COVID claim. They're both very complicated and will take a long time to, to know how much we're gonna receive in the end. 
Uh, the council also established the ad hoc budget committee and the revenue committees. I want to talk a little bit about the trends in the general fund revenues and primarily the, the revenues that are um, affected by tourism. Uh, the sales tax estimates for fiscal year 2022 are about 5% below our original fiscal 2022 estimate. And the, I want to uh, talk a little bit about where we're at to date. So fiscal 2020 actuals and fiscal 2021 projected sales tax is slightly less than fiscal 2019 actuals. So we didn't, re, uh, we didn't see the loss in sales tax that we saw in the Great Recession, but we didn't see any growth um, either. And we had some positive sales tax uh, actions when the court approved the Wayfair decision and online sales were taxed and we could receive taxes for those. So we should have seen growth uh, and we really didn't. Um, but I'm happy that we did maintain almost what we were receiving in fiscal year 2019. Uh, the TOT budget estimate is for 2022 is about 19% below fiscal year 2019. So that was our last full pre-pandemic year. Uh, this summer season will be telling on how fast we're going to recover. So our, our largest uh, TOT months are July, August, and September. Uh, so we'll see how that, or June, July, and August, I'm sorry. We'll see how that, uh, how we recover there. Uh, the same with admissions tax. We estimated about 55% below where we were in 2019. Uh, the current fiscal year, 2021, we're 97% below where we were in 2019. So hopefully we can um, recover to at least about half of what we were collecting in 2019, but the summer will be very telling for where we end up projecting like a full revenue recovery in fiscal year 2024. So um, next fiscal year, we're, you know, projecting that we won't be quite back to normal yet, but uh, time will tell. Uh, the budget also includes just under 14.2 million in American Rescue Plan funding. As Martin, that was collected this fiscal year and then half will be collected next fiscal year. There is a qualification process that we're working through and uh, they're also currently making the rules for the allowed uses uh, for that, those funds. Uh, one of the, the difference between the legislation and the interim rule adopted by the Department of Treasury is that we cannot use it to restore reserves. So we are lobbying to be able to do that. And, um, but we're also working on another plan for how we can claim those funds and make sure that the city benefits from that. On the expenditure side, uh, the budget that's being uh, presented to you today is primarily status quo from fiscal year 2021, additional reductions in it. And then we also restored the one-time cuts that were implemented in fiscal 2021. We did not include any furloughs. Uh, we also lifted the hiring freeze. Uh, we have, um, as I mentioned, we have some budget reductions uh, implemented for four departments, and each of those departments will present their reductions when they present their budget to you. Uh, we restored the transfer, the TOT transfer to the Economic Development Trust Fund. Uh, that should aid in our recovery of our business community. And we continued the reduction in the workers' comp rates and there are some minor staffing changes that will be covered by each department. Excuse me. I could never be a public speaker like you guys. <laughs> uh, the capital investment program is mostly unfunded. We did set aside $2 million to use as a match in case uh, there are federal infrastructure funds available. Uh, we did not include any funding for street resurfacing. We can only do this for one year as uh, gas tax requires that we have a general fund maintenance of effort. So there's a minimum level that we need to contribute from the general fund for uh, street resurfacing every year. We do have a backlog of projects. So we were able to um, skip funding for this year as some of that backlog will be done and that will meet our maintenance of effort requirement. 
Uh, new in this budget is an interfund transfer to reduce the deficit fund balance in the general fund CIP fund. Uh, we have three CIP funds that have deficit fund balances that we need to start addressing. I think we included a, a million dollars this year to uh, start um, bringing down that deficit. So those transfers will go on for a number of years until we can get those funds out of a defi deficit fund balance. It's been building up for years. Um, on the debt service side, uh, we the general fund borrowed from the workers' comp fund in 2018 to prepay PERS liability. Uh, we should have established a repayment of that loan starting the next fiscal year, and we didn't. So we're establishing that this fiscal year. So that will take approximately 10 years to repay that loan at $500,000 a year. And I also want to note this is the last year of the pension obligation bonds that were issued maybe. Um, and that will that'll end up with a savings of about $3.2 million next fiscal year, and that is built into the forecast that I will show you. So here's the forecast graphs that um, come from the management partners forecast model. So I have uh, two side-by-side -side graphs without federal stimulus and with federal stimulus. So this blue line is our reserve goal. So the general, uh, the Government Finance Officers Association uh, best practice for reserves is two months of operating expenditures. So that's this goal right here. This is where we project our reserves to be. <clears throat> so a structural deficit is when your uh, revenues don't keep pace with your expenditures. So the fact that the reserves are being drawn down means that our expenditures exceed our, our revenues. So without the federal stimulus, um, it's a pretty steep decline to no reserves in fiscal year 2023. With the stim, uh, we get back to our reserve goal a little bit above it, um, but we still have a structural deficit. And on the next slide, I'll show you what these deficits are. But you can see the 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 stimulus does buy us some time to make decisions about how to handle the structural deficit in our budget. And I also want to know. Um, these projections do not include funding for ongoing capital or emerging issues like homelessness. So these graphs um, match the, the graphs that I just showed you, and they're without federal stimulus, with federal stimulus. And this is the amount of surplus, if it's above the line, or deficit, if it's below the line. So without the stimulus, our deficit is one to eight million per year. So you can see the worst year would have been the the proposed budget year, fiscal year 2022 at eight million. And then there are years where it improves and it's only one million, but it's never a surplus. So we have a continuing deficit to address. Uh, this is with the stimulus. Um, so we have a we would have a surplus in fiscal year 2021 with a seven million in revenue. In 2022, we have about a 1.3 to 1.4 million dollar deficit, and then the future deficits would range from one to five million dollars. Uh, these post reductions uh, in this proposed budget. They total um, just over 1.2 million. And the largest, I think, is the Parks Department at 617,000. And if you recall, they had almost all one-time reductions <clears throat> in the fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, Public Works is also projecting 495,000 in new revenue, in addition to their $348,000 in reductions. This is a reserve chart um, that we've looked at in the past with, um, I added on the fiscal year 2022 estimates. So these reserves are what we typically call the general fund reserve. 
There, there are four reserves that we um, include in the general fund. The other post-employment benefits reserve, the pension reserve, and the stabilization reserve. The OPEB reserve and the pension reserve are invested in the Section 115 trust fund. So this is the total of all those reserves. And then this green line at the bottom is the reserve goal, which is approximately 17% or months of operating expenditures. Uh, the reserve estimates include the American Rescue Plan funding. Our reserves are also a sign of the city's fiscal stability. Um, it's good reserves help us when we have to borrow money. We get lower interest rates when we have good reserves. It's looked on favorably um, by the rating agencies. And in times of fiscal, this last two fiscal years, we also have more time to make decisions about how we want to uh, make our budget sustainable again. And since 70% of our budget is staffing, it, it reduces the impact on city employees when we can take more time to make decisions. Uh, so I just want to note that in fiscal year 20, we dropped below our reserve goal. In fiscal year 2021, uh, with the stimulus funds, we should be above our reserve goal. And then in fiscal year 2022, we're uh, drawing down on those reserves a little bit, but we're still right around our reserve goal. Uh, there are other funds we often look at um, for, for funding, the Economic Development Trust Fund. We did uh, stop the transfer of that for one fiscal year. So that uh, was about a million dollars to the general fund. Uh, the majority of that fund has been um, committed for projects. And so the fiscal year 2021 ending fund estimate is less than a million dollars. And then with the restoration of the transfer back to that fund of transient occupancy tax, uh, it gets back up to $1.7 million, um, but that allows the economic development staff to uh, propose to use those funds for uh, projects that would help uh, stimulate our economy. The workers' comp fund, we drew down four in fiscal year 2020. So we had a, over an $8 million balance that fiscal year. We drew that down and we're still hanging around the $4 million mark. Uh, the City Public Trust Fund uh, is the fund where we deposit uh, the proceeds of property sales. So there are some projects proposed in the uh, fiscal year 2022 budgets that draw down on that fund a little bit. Uh, we do have um, a few funds in deficit fund balance. Um, so I mentioned these three earlier, the general fund CIP, the street maintenance CIP, and the stormwater overlay fund. So we will develop like a long-term strategy for bringing those funds out of a deficit. Uh, Martin parking fund, it, it did have very healthy reserves and we depleted those during the pandemic, unfortunately. Um, but that we will be able to build that fund back up as soon as the tourism returns uh, to the city. The Equipment Operations Fund also has a deficit fund balance. Uh, the Public Works staff and the Finance staff work together this year to make sure that that deficit is low. Um, and then as part of the cost allocation plan we were do, are doing, we'll develop a plan to make sure that fund gets out of a deficit. I wanna talk a little bit about the unfunded capital investment program. So we always spend a lot of time talking about our capital program, but not our unfunded capital program. Uh, tomorrow we will discuss these general fund priority one projects. They were projects that request this fiscal year, but weren't funded. They total about $3.7 million. The entire total of the unfunded CIP is over $300 million with the majority of that being in transportation projects. So the calendar, uh, the tentative calendar, because some of these may change a little bit or we may change the order. Uh, today, the overview and fiscal outlook, and then we have five departments presenting their budgets. 
tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. Uh, we have the rest of the departments presenting their budgets, uh, closing with the capital investment program. And we're scheduled for adoption on Tuesday, June 8th. And we could push that to June 22nd if we needed to, but uh, I think our budget staff is committed to getting you everything you need to adopt on June 8th. And with that, I'll turn it back to Martine. Uh, thank you. So as far as next steps are concerned, uh, really it's just continuing to, to build on what we're already doing uh, to try to uh, develop a, a, a fiscal strategy that focuses on recovery, uh, resiliency, uh, and, and trying to, to balance uh, uh, the need for um, additional revenues uh, and addressing critical needs. Uh, so we can hopefully focus on trying to restore some of the existing services that we have. We have we do have major deficits in uh, particularly our maintenance. Uh, parks maintenance has been particularly hard hit and you'll hear from that department about the, some of the challenges there. Uh, and it would be helpful to try to catch up with some of that, particularly as parks uh, in particular have had high use uh, and that continues to, to be the case even post pandemic. Um, uh, we also need to really have a more of a robust investment in capital program and infrastructure. As uh, you saw, we have a, a long list of unfunded projects. Uh, in this proposed budget, do we do uh, uh, have have made an attempt aside the two million dollars to, to try to take advantage of the uh, potential uh, additional funding that might be available to the state and and, and the federal. Uh, uh, grants process and so we want to be in a position to try to leverage as much as we can and also if we were able to assess flexibly have a revenue measure that could also potentially be uh, a revenue source to do that uh, the, the the timing is, is is critical in that respect um, and uh, uh, again looking at the uh, uh, ahead at the, what our new services and, and direction that the council might also be interested in in, in exploring uh, given uh, the uh, changing needs of the community. As far as uh, gener generating new revenue, as I noted, uh, we will be uh, looking at the potentially a, a ballot revenue measure in uh, November of 2021. The council would have to make a decision uh, next month, although there is a think about uh, whether there will be a special election uh, for a recall election and, and whether that might impact the timing of the revenue measure that, that we don't know yet. So we'll update the council when we know that. And then also we, we want to continue to, to do as much uh, cost recovery as we can in, in all of our programs as appropriate. So we'll continue to try to make progress there to uh, recover uh, costs wherever we can uh, uh, do that uh, in all of our that are eligible for uh, cost of services. Um, and so with that, uh, again, the next steps are for you to hear all the department's uh, presentations, to ask questions. Uh, uh, if you need more information, we will get it to, to you so that when this comes back to you, uh, you can uh, make a decision uh, about the next fiscal year budget. And uh, with that, we're happy to answer any, any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, to everybody, um, for all your work. Um, it's been a rough year, and I know you've been working nonstop to understand the impacts. And uh, so really, really appreciate your work, but also that, you know, things look a little brighter ahead. So thank you for tracking things. And um, also just personally want to thank all of our employees as well uh, for their sacrifice this past year um, and uh, recognize that um, that helped tremendously in terms of keeping the city um, financially stable, at least through this time. Uh, are there any questions right now from council members regarding the presentation so far? Um, Next up will be Susan Nimitz, who will um, give us a, um, a presentation on uh, the library budget. Um, questions, uh, I see Council Member Cummings. Thank you, and thank you for that presentation. I did have one question um, that's somewhat related. So in previous years, we've kind of received um, packets that have, you know, if council members need to make cuts there were programs where there was like contributions to Meals on Wheels or different types of programs. Um, we would usually receive, you know, a packet that outlined, you know, what programs we we're gonna maintain and what we we're gonna cut. And we didn't receive that this year and it's really not clear, um, you know, 
what's happening with the funding for those programs. And so I was just kind of curious about whether we were going to be receiving another document that we'd be making decisions on or when we'd be discussing those items. Yes, uh, those recommendations typically come from the uh, Community Programs Committee. Um, I'll have to ask, uh, I think, Laura if, uh, what the status is of that. Or are you, you're muted, Laura. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry about that, Mayor. Um, Council Member Cummings, the Community Programs Committee, uh, it's status quo budget, so nothing is changing from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. So all of those um, programs will stay status quo at this point. I guess, well, um, so does that include, for example, I know that there are things like the um, UCSC task force, and, um, the person who we've hired for that, and then there's also things like tenant sanctuary that have been included in the past. Does that also mean that funding will be included for that? Because I think I want to ensure that some of those programs are going to be maintaining their funding. And it's just helpful for us to see if we're going to pass the budget and that information is not present. Um, each department who has respective funding for a given program will cover that for the long range development program <laughs> consulting funding. That was a one time funding. So, and it was extended, I believe, for six months. And um, I, I believe that's the case. Lee Butler can correct me if I am wrong. So the question of further pursuing funding there will have to be handled in the planning and community development budget. And then for any of the funding um, details related to the core programs as bu budget that was in council, I'll be covering that during the council member, um, the council city manager's office and city attorney's office budget. Um, tenant sanctuary and um, the core service programs were held at status quo from fiscal year 21. Okay, um, I just, yeah, I just wanted to bring it up. Members of the public were mentioning that they were concerned that those programs wouldn't be funded. And so since we don't have anything to share with them, it's just, it just wasn't clear, so. Yeah, so just to add a little more clarity. So those will be covered under the city council budget and city manager budget as appropriate. And what's being proposed is status quo essentially. And so council will have to give direction on some of those or one time if you want to continue to do that that'll be the opportunity for council to wait. Okay, this is what we did this year. For next year, we'd like to see this, or, or if there's a different direction. Uh, so we'll make sure and cover all those items within those respective uh, budget, uh, where they're budgeted in each of those departments. And then I guess my, my last question is, would, can we, if this is status quo and it's not changing from last year, can we get a printout of the different programs that we funded in previous sure. years? Sounds like we could just, that, that shouldn't be too hard to. Yes, yes, and I think they're in the budget document, but yes, we'll make sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, are there any other council members with questions at this point? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, we're going to take public comment at the end of all the presentations, so I'll invite um, Susan Nimitz, the Director of Libraries, to give her presentation on the library budget. Welcome, Susan. I was hoping the PowerPoint could go up. That's okay. Um, I can start it without it. Um, Bonnie, you, do you have it? Yeah, does Bonnie have that or? I wasn't told I'm supposed to run it. Do you oh, want me to run I'm it? sorry, I can share it. Um, I, I, have it, I have it here if it would be, okay. if you want. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Susan Nimitz. I'm the director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. I'm happy to speak to you today about our FY 2022 operating budget. Um, as the PowerPoint comes up, it'll show you an organization chart. Uh, the Santa Cruz Public Libraries is sort of a Department of the City of Santa Cruz. Um, I actually report to a joint powers board that consists of the City of Santa Cruz, the City of Capitola, the City of Scotts Valley, and the County 
each with their city managers and county administrator serving as the board. It is a joint powers board uh, that requires under its agreement um, pretty much unanimity to move forward on any major item. Um, we also have a citizens advisory commission uh, that serves as sort of the um, community standards board um, and does a lot of the policy making and um, strategic planning for the library system. Bonnie, if you could move to the next slide. And of course, library patrons with masks. <laughs> so the next slide, I just wanted to talk um, about our strategic plan. We did a plan in 2016 that really focused on transforming the operations of the library as we transform the buildings. Um, one of the things that we're going to do over the next fiscal year is redo that strategic plan in preparation of the opening of the vast majority of our buildings at the end of fiscal 2022. The next slide talks a little bit about the last year and golly gee, it's been a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, we started the fiscal year by reducing our staff by about a third. We did a major reorganization to provide services. We've gone through uh, three service models in 12 months. The first was curbside, then grab and go where people come into the building and get pre-ordered materials. And we moved at the beginning of May to a modified open. Um, we created a laptop Wi-Fi checkout. We created remote printing so people could drive up and grab their printing jobs. We switched all of our thousands of programs to digital with a real focus on resilience programming. I know many of you participated in that in the last year and I'm very grateful. We coordinated with school lunch programs to provide uh, library services at school lunch pickup sites, which picture that you see in front of you. We provided deposit collections at some of our traditional bookmobile sites like nursing homes, daycare, in isolated parts of the county. We continue to partner with Encompass and WINGS to provide services for people experiencing homelessness. You'll have seen uh, tables set up around the library. Um, we were providing most of those services outside and we provided a mailing program for books. We also went incredibly digital. Um, actually, the next slide is great because we can a little bit about where we are in our facility project. In 2016, the taxpayers of Santa Cruz provided $67 million through Project S to begin to upgrade all of our facilities. We have completed the Felton Library and the La Salva Library. Capital opening on the 12th of June. It's beautiful, we're very excited. Boulder Creek, Garfield Park, and Brant Safari 40 are all under construction as we speak. And this fall, we will start Aptos, Scotts Valley. We have a major seismic upgrade that's gonna go on there. Live Oak is gonna have a small remodel, and we're gonna begin developing the Live Oak Annex at the Simpkins Swim Center. And then we're in design development in the downtown library. The next slide. So because we are JPA, our funding comes from a variety of sources. And um, we have about $15 million this year in revenue. The city under your budget pays 1.8 million from its general fund. The library in return pays $500,000 for overhead costs. I have to say that employees of the library, because you're our fiscal agent, are employees of the city of Santa Cruz. We also pay for things like counting, legal, and human resources. Um, this uh, 
$1.8 million is an increase of about $70,000. That $70,000 increase was negotiated over five years ago as part of the Library Financing Authority, another JPA's um, agreement. And today, under your consent agenda, you extended that agreement one more year. Next year, though, a new agreement needs to be developed. And um, there is expected to be a large increase in the city's share of funding that will break. Um, we're probably looking at something in terms of maybe $300,000. And so that is something that we're gonna have to work on over the next year. The county library fund, which includes both the cities of Capitola and Scotts Valley, is looking to put nearly two million dollars more in um, the library funding as well. Our remaining funds, um, about half of our funds come from a um, 0.25 cent sales tax um, that was approved, I think in 1997, um, I, I may misspeak. Um, the next slide, shows you the detailed budget, which I'm sure no one can read. And unfortunately, it's not in your budget packet um, because it's in the JPA's budget packet. Um, what it shows is we have about 15 million in revenue and about 17 million in expenditures. We do have a structural imbalance this year. We have very large fund balances and reserves that will get us through the next fiscal year. And then hopefully um, the uh, negotiations between the city and the library, county library fund will happen. Um, and we, again, expect about $2.3 million from those negotiations. The next slide. Just over the next year, what are we gonna be working on? Construction projects, construction projects, construction projects. Um, I think we'll all be wearing hard hats. Um, we are going to try and raise a million dollars for Garfield Park, grants of 40, and uh, at the Aptos Libraries. I know many of you are involved with the Friends in doing that. I really appreciate uh, your commitment to that. We're going to have to renegotiate the funding contract we need to develop a long-term capital maintenance plan and leases for each of our buildings. We need to improve both staffing and hours. And probably not in 22, but probably in 23, we're going to have a reshuffling of library staff where uh, staff that belong with the downtown library need to be in the building and staff in administration need to be in the administrative building so that we can um, assign costs appropriately. Um, that will require us to move our server room and um, will be a, a major step in preparing us for the building of the downtown library. Next, I couldn't resist showing you a picture of the empty Brant Supporty Library um, it's a beautiful mid-century modern building with these boomerang um, wood ceilings. Again, we're gonna honor the beauty of the building. The picture on the right is what will it will look like um, each summer of next year. And the following picture is our beautiful Carnegie Library, Garfield Park, which I'm sure none of you have ever seen empty. <laughs> um, when we were in it, we had all the windows covered with bookshelves. And you can see what an extraordinary space this library is. On the right is what the children's section of the library will look like. Again, it will honor the beauty of the architectural style of the building and open it up in the way that it existed um, as a Carnegie Library when it first opened with a shelving around the perimeter. Um, this will open probably in March of 2022. And then last but not least, we're working hard on the downtown multi-use project. 
As you're fully aware, the RFPs for both the housing partner and the master architect are out, and the selection process is beginning with recommendations coming to you later this summer. Um, we're really looking forward to doing the design for this project um, and of course anticipating the amazing library it will become. Last but not least, I just wanna thank you all for the incredible support that the City Council has provided the library over these years. Um, I think that our progress is really coming to fruition and I can't wait to invite you to a library opening. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Susan. Is there any questions from um, council members now for Susan at this time? I am not seeing any hands raised. Oh, I do see one. Uh, council member Cummings. Thank you for that presentation. And it's great to see get on all of our beautiful libraries. Um, I did have one question. So there's about four or five um, libraries, it seemed like from the list that you had that are gonna be under construction. I'm just curious, you know, what happens with all those collections during those times? Do they go to the main branch or is there somewhere where they're being stored? And, you know, because there's always that concern of, you know, when a branch is closed, how do people get access locally? And so I'm just wondering you know, how that's being addressed. Um, there will be one point this year, um, Council Member Cummings, where five of our branches are closed at the same time, which will be a peak moment for us. The Friends of the Library have um, moved out of the downtown branch with part of our work plan. They had a large uh, storage space for their downtown bookstore. And we're taking that over and putting books um, out of the public view, but accessible to staff to pull or hold. Um, but I do have to say that there will be a moment in time where we're gonna have to put some in um, storage and just take them offline. Uh, we're very lucky that we have amazing tools that will tell us what are the books that are le least likely to go out, um, sort of based on popularity. We will also offer interlibrary loans. So if there's any item a person really wants, we can get it from another library. And then are those, I guess, are those costs covered under the funding that was previously available for those um, products? We have um, established uh, moving costs in the cost of the project as we move forward. Okay. I was just curious whether or not those were additional costs or where those costs come from. Um, I know that's come up in the past, so thank you. Yes, it has. Thank you. Any other questions from council members at this time? Thank you. Good luck with your budget process. Thank you, Susan. Great to see you. Bye. Appreciate it. Um, I will now call on uh, Kim Krauss, our finance director, to give a presentation on the finance department budget. Hi, Kim Krauss, finance director. I'll share my screen again. Uh, so this time I'm presenting the finance department budget. Uh, I'll have an overview of the department, how we're organized, uh, the fiscal year 2021 highlights of our work, um, our proposed budget, and then our goals and initiatives for fiscal year 2022. Uh, so we're organized into five sections. Accounting, uh, they do financial reporting and grants. Uh, they also do the capital improvement budget, uh, the revenue division, uh, in addition to collecting all the money uh, that the city collects. They also um, oversee uh, transient occupancy tax audits and debt collections. Uh, the accounts pay payroll and the accounts payable and payroll division, they also have purchasing. Uh, the budget division, they also assist with long range forecasting and uh, costing for bargaining unit negotiations. And the risk and safety management division, uh, they are in charge of the city's liability insurance and claims, property insurance, any accidents we might have and workplace safety. 
Some of the highlights from fiscal 2021 include uh, we expanded our online portal uh, for payments and reporting to include cannabis business taxes and utility user taxes. Previously, this was only used for uh, TOT tax. We implemented um, or were part of a team, the digital payment portal known as My City of Santa Cruz um, for utility bills and business licenses. Uh, we're, our primary portion was the business license section. We also um, implemented the management partners forecasting tool uh, that guides us and informs uh, that we make so we can see what a $500,000 decision um, that's an ongoing expense or a revenue looks like 10 years from now. It's very helpful. Uh, we've been collaborating, collaborating with other city departments and FEMA to submit the application for the COVID-19 disaster reimbursement. Uh, we've only submitted for reimbursement through last September. It is a very slow and time consuming um, process to submit those claims. Um, but we're working on the next claim, I think, which is through partially through January. We streamlined the budget adjustment process to improve our communication and turnaround times. Uh, so sometimes the budget adjustments will get stalled and, and didn't get approved or moved along internally in finance for uh, weeks. Uh, so we made an online process where it goes through workflow and notifies everyone by email that there's a budget adjustment to approve. We initiated the cost allocation plan update. Uh, so our cost allocation plan where we uh, spread um, overhead costs to other departments and the utilities is very old. So we were under to update that plan and it will be an Excel model that we can update our costs every year and make sure that we're current. Uh, they'll, they will also provide a guide that's very transparent as to how the costs are being allocated. Um, we, we were recognized by the Government Finance Officers Association for um, excellence in our preparing our comprehensive annual financial report and our budget documents. And then on the risk side, uh, we supported the development and update of all safety program policies, include, including COVID-19 protocols, you know, which change and are difficult to figure out. So that has been quite a workload for that division to stay up with those and make sure we're all following the right protocols. Uh, the, and those staff work in conjunction with HR. Uh, this is a picture of the finance department proposed budget for fiscal 2022. So the overall citywide um, staffing is about 70% of the budget, the general fund budget. In finance, it's about 87%. We have very little in supplies and services. It's, it's almost all personnel. Our total budget is 4.1 million. We did propose some reductions that would not impact our services. Uh, we reduced our temporary um, employment staff uh, by 34,000. We reduced professional services and subscriptions by about 40,000. And then miscellaneous office supplies by 5,000 for total reductions of 79,000. Uh, we also oversee the liability fund. So that's the risk management, the insurances and the claims and um, you know litigation costs. So that is the opposite of the finance department budget. It is 90% of services and supplies and 10% people. I do wanna call out the cost increases and the liability insurance. So this is, uh, you can see since fiscal uh, 2018, it's gone up by more than a million dollars for liability insurance. And this is the re result of the environment that we're in and the, the amount of litigation that cities are seeing. Uh, we're becoming hard to insure in some cases. Also, you know, the result of uh, like some of the uh, uh, climate change action. So insurance companies have seen huge losses. So with, you know, fires and floods and hurricanes, um, it, it all has a bad result on our insurance costs. 
Our goals for fiscal year 2022 um, include updating our investment policy. Uh, we wanna see if we can diversify our investments uh, to provide higher yields while maintaining our safety and liquidity. Uh, we're gonna continue to work with the Council Ad Hoc Revenue Committee to find new or enhanced revenue sources. Uh, we will continue to pursue federal and state aid and ensure that we comply with the American Rescue Act uh, requirements. Uh, the initial interim rule was 150 pages long, so I'm looking forward to the final rule and uh, having some, some guidance in that area. Uh, we will continue to use the forecast from management partners to guide our fiscal strategies and decision making. Um, as I mentioned before, you can input 500,000 and see the long-term imp uh, impact of that. On our, for our core services, we're gonna finalize the cost allocation plan. Uh, we will continue to update our financial policies to ensure that we're following best practices and um, we wanna improve our operational efficiencies and we will continue to support departments and help them with, um, you know, uh, cost recovery and if it's feasible. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Kim. Are there any council members with questions at this time? Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you so much for that, Kim. Um, could you just really quickly go back to the slide um, with the proposed reductions? Um, mm -hmm. Buy a little quickly for me, so I just wanted to take a look at that slip. So the personnel is just temporary staff. So mm -hmm. we hire temporary staff to do things for us, like scan documents, and that's the reduction there. Got it, okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from council members at this time? Seeing none. So um, Kim, thank you and your and your um, department for all your work. And um, I'm sure we might have some questions as we work our way through the budget this year. Great, thank you for all your work. Next up, I will call um, on Lisa Murphy, our human resources director to give a presentation on the human resources budget. Welcome Lisa. Good afternoon, everybody. Good night to see you all again. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And I'm assuming you all can see my screen. So uh, today I'll give you a, a brief overview of the Human Resources Department. Your screen, yeah, you may see, yep. Okay, just briefly, our mission as a resource and trusted advisor, we strive to cultivate an inspiring and fulfilling work environment that attracts and engages a talented workforce. Some major accomplishments, I really can't say and have it's been really all about COVID-19 response. Uh, the policies that we created, the having our employees, uh, sending them home, uh, create a place for them, uh, every day was really, pretty much focused on for my team on our COVID-19 response. Uh, we did have some negotiations in between there. Uh, we have a major uh, initiative underway for diversity, equity, and, and inclusion just within the HR department. As part of that, we've been revising our job descriptions. We've reduced minimum standards, which uh, tend to be a barrier to entry on education. Uh, we're, did, we're uh, just releasing our requirement for implicit bias training for all hiring panels. And we also initiated a new employee bias training program. Another big move for us in between all of this was moving to online application process. Uh, we're trying to move everything we can with regard to the recruitment process. And I'll show you why that's important later when you see that we have over 3,000 applicants uh, each year. And doing those paper-wise was just not efficient. And again, lastly, although there's lots of accomplishments and I have an amazing team, more COVID-19 response. And honestly, this took the entire department for the, to implement our response. Our benefits team and managing all the federal state leave, confusing, uh, trying to uh, add every day something new. 
uh, again, trying to recruit and do training online via Zoom, very, very difficult, but my staff pivoted really well to make that happen. Um, so I just want to do a shout out to how uh, my department has the employees in the labor relations arena as well has really responded to to what 19. Uh, for our budget, we are very small. We are just 2% of the entire, for general fund of the entire city's budget. Some major changes you'll see that I'll just jump out real quickly is in 2019, we added what we, a medical insurance uh, is all now centered in my department, which makes me look like I have this huge bloated budget, but I really don't. You'll see that nearly 80% of my budget is made up of medical insurance, $19 million. But one thing I thought was really important, for the most part, my budget is very status quo. Um, from the previous year, we did eliminate a part-time position as part of the budget reduction. But one thing I want to call your attention to as a result of COVID, our unemployment insurance dramatically increased from an average of 90,000 a year in FY20 to 278,000 claims in FY21. And that's really significant uh, in terms of the number of folks that have had to seek out uh, additional resources in unemployment insurance. So an overview of our budget, we're really five divisions that make up my budget. It's administration, which is blue, and administration means that's us, that's the people that are doing the work. Uh, unemployment is this little tiny orange. Workers' comp, these are, this is in the gray here. Uh, you can see that that's 13% of my budget, and that's where we pay out claims from our department. And then the bulk here is the medical insurance premiums that are now coming out of my department. It didn't used to, and you can see this is what it looked like in the old days, pre-medical uh, insurance. Uh, so it looked like a pretty standard budget. I had just a minor amount, but now uh, for accounting purposes, it's all located within my budget. Uh, and then we also have the volunteer program, which is just $40,000 or 45, and it's, uh, it's less than 1% of my budget. Briefly about what HR admin is, we support 750, over 750 regular employees, and in time between 400 and 500 temp employees. And those, those services include training and development, recruitment, employee and labor relations, workers' compensation, and benefit administration. Just an idea of uh, how important it was for us to, all of with our recruitment information and our applications, is you can see what our recruitment data looks like uh, from 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And what you can see here actually, unfortunately, is you see this big dip, but that's again because of COVID and our, our hiring freeze. But we're pretty steady from a high of over 4,500 applicants, just a as, as slight little decline here to uh, about 2,000 applicants that in this current, in, in FY21, although the year is not over, but we definitely had a decrease. But when you handle over between three and 4,000 applications and review, my staff reviews each and every one of those applications. It's extremely important that we become efficient and we do that online. So I handle employee and labor relations. And what does that mean? We handle all the negotiations for eight units. We work a lot on resolving workplace issues, whether it's discipline or investigations, conflict resolution, we also house the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee, Commission, excuse me, I have committee notes commission. Out of Employee and Labor Relations, we also have our Employee Engagement Program, and Development Program, all of our menti mentoring, coaching programs, all are housed here, as well as our new initiative for the diversity, equity, and inclusion. We see our EEO committee uh, that is in our houses, our department is in our department. Its purpose is to serve as a communication channel between city employees, the community, city manager, city council, and EE coordinator for equal employment opportunities. And, and that body is made up of nine members. Two are actually appointed by your council. I believe you just recently did and had an appointment. And then we have internal appointments from um, city manager's office. Uh, we have employees. Um, I have an area. So the executive from three employees, we have one SEIU and two other bargaining units. And they're working on their annual report, which is going to, will be online on our website that everybody should take a look at because they do a lot of work and a lot of initiatives underway, including they are the, uh, the leaders in the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiative. 
do want to just you know tell our own horn about our employee training and development that we put on. We have over 65 development classes. That includes mandatory training, leadership development academy, cultural awareness, financial management, and wellness programs. There's so much more that happened in here in these, these courses. And of course, it's been really difficult to maintain attendance on Zoom, uh, but we're hoping to get back to live training at some point in time. Uh, but I wanna commend my staff for uh, maintaining the, the uh, enthusiasm to keep our folks um, in these training classes and keep them exciting. So uh, again, and they, these classes are also open and available to yourselves as well. And just a reminder, our HR benefits team, they employ, help our, our team with their benefits, including medical, dental, vision, life insurance, disability, and retirement. And remember, we have over 700, close to 800 employees and have a, a very small staff that fields all of these questions that on a daily basis uh, that are very complicated and really honestly takes a just to really get through some of these difficult rules and laws about all of our benefits. So again, I wanna commend my staff for their work on that. And finally, with our workers' compensation division, uh, we had over 105 new claims. That's pretty steady, pretty average. I don't have the comparison over the years, but it's not anything to be of concern. It can be anything from an injured finger to a bad back. There's a number of different um, claims, but everything needs to be submitted. And this also includes uh, claims that are COVID-19. Our volunteer program, just want to shout out to them how great they've been doing for us as a contract service with the Santa Cruz Volunteer Center. Although the numbers are quite down from the previous years because uh, we had 316 volunteers with over 8,000 hours, volunteer hours. Previously, those numbers would be almost triple. Uh, and I think they're looking forward to being able to get it back. Uh, there's a lot of need for volunteers out there and, um, untapped resources, and, and we have a new individual, Laurel O'Keefe, uh, retired just recently, and the staff's taken over, and we want to do a shout out to Laurel and thank her for her hard work. And just briefly, our priorities this year, I have not changed them because I think it's good to have them, although I've added, my staff has added a few. Employee development really means, is a, a, a focus for us. We want to continue with our professional and personal development. Succession planning is really going to be, uh, needs to be on the forefront right now. We've had over uh, 25 of the um, retirement incentives. We've had a lot of people retire due to COVID-19. Uh, a lot of institutional memory there. And uh, so we really, we started our efforts a couple of years ago. And we've been lucky that we've been able to um, hire internally. Uh, but it's still gonna be a huge push because coming this summer, we're gonna be opening up a number of, of those um, retirement center positions and it's gonna to be tough. Um, again, we always continue to improve our organizational culture. Uh, we put the employee engagement program on hold. We're gonna put, because of COVID, we're gonna start that back up again. Uh, I think we're gonna have a lot of new challenges. I don't even identify in here about the culture with folks working from home and the impact of people coming back from COVID-19. It's gonna be a lot of changes for people and a lot of um, scary feelings of coming back into this, this setting. So I think we're gonna to have to pivot on that and have a whole new um, focus on how to retain our culture uh, and support our employees while they're off site, it's, it's obviously very different um, culture when you're not all within the office working together. So we're gonna have to really um, learn on, on the fly <laughs> and how to do better and how we can uh, maintain our culture. And that concludes my presentation, just as a reminder that we serve the people who serve the community. You can't, can't function without HR. You won't have your people without HR. We get you this, those folks and, and we take a lot of pride in our work. And, um, hope that uh, the community understands the importance of uh, it does and uh, for them to help you deliver the services and, and implement the policies you want implemented. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks very much, Lisa. Appreciate it. And um, always learn a lot about what your department does. <laughs> small little department over there on the other side of City Hall, but you guys do so much, so thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from council members at this point? I'm 
not seeing any hands. So thank you again, Lisa. We appreciate it. I'm sure we'll have questions next week. And um, I will move on to inviting Ken Morgan, Director of Information Technology, to give a presentation on the IT budget, please. Welcome, Ken. Uh, good afternoon. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Myers, Vice Mayor Bruner, and my name is Ken Morgan, uh, IT Director, and I'm here to give you an overview of our proposed budget for uh, the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, the presentation will include a department overview, uh, a discussion of our core services. Um, I'd like to highlight some of our key accomplishments this past year, as well as some of our goals for the upcoming fiscal year. And then finally, a couple of slides summarizing our 22 budget. These amazing people make up the city's IT department. When we are fully staffed, the IT department has 21 full-time equivalent employees. Uh, this includes three individuals being funded by our enterprise departments. And what you are seeing collectively is 195 years of experience working, uh, and the average IT employee has been with the city for 11 years. Eight of us have been here for more than 15 years, so a lot of, a lot of experience with the team. <clears throat> Uh, our mission is to uh, cultivate increased connectivity of people, technology, and processes, and we do this by trying to deliver business-driven, efficient, quality technology solutions and services for both the staff and the public. And these efforts really do start with our client services team. These folks are responsible for receiving thousands of annual requests via phone calls, uh, work orders to the city's help desk. They do an amazing job of supporting the hardware and software in the city's endpoint infrastructure. We have PCs, uh, we have laptops, mobile devices, desk phones, uh, and altogether, our device ecosystem is about uh, 1,900 uh, different devices that we support. <clears throat> Our infrastructure services team uh, manages network infra infrastructure and data centers and offices throughout the city. Uh, this includes our wired and wireless networks, our server infrastructure, which includes close to 200 virtual and physical servers, uh, our voice over IP, IP telephone equipment. Uh, we have 600 desk phones. And then they spend a lot of time on security and whether that's uh, cybersecurity uh, to keep the bad guys off of our network or uh, physical access to protect our assets and facilities. Our process and application solutions team provides support for over 100 citywide applications. These folks are our database admins, our developers, our custom report writers, our project managers, and really just our application experts. And then last, we have our strategic and admin services division and work on uh, special projects, personnel decisions, and of course, budget planning and execution like we are today. <clears throat> Before I get to our accomplishments, I did want to give a little perspective on how COVID impacted IT last year and, and really kind of how we responded. Um, IT was a, a focal point for really maintaining that business continuity with uh, as, as 200 users requesting to be connected from home. Uh, and then as the pandemic kind of played out over the last year, we continued to shift our service delivery to adjust to this new normal. So not only were we supporting the on-premise compute infra infrastructure, but we were also helping people from home supporting personal devices, home Wi-Fi networks, uh, web conferencing tools, coffee machines, you name it, we, we jumped in and did our best to kind of keep that business continuity moving forward. Um, but to really kind of con things, like a lot of departments, we suffered some pretty extreme uh, staffing levels. Uh, we had retirements, hiring freezes, uh, medical issues, and in the end, we were left with about 70% of our staff for the majority of the fiscal year. And, you know, when you're a small uh, team, losing six people uh, of 21 is, is a pretty amazing challenge, but uh, it's a challenge that, in my estimation, was really met with some incredible determination and, and a lot of pride in what we do and led to some pretty cool accomplishments. Um, it starts with our client services team. I think Martine mentioned employee resiliency, and these folks really epitomize that. Traditionally, this is a team of four specialists and an IT manager. They operated with three specialists for the, I, the entire year and still completed close to 6,000 tickets. Uh, they were turning those tickets around in about three days. Of the 800 or so employees, we received requests from 600 different employees, so clearly a service that is used throughout the, uh, the enterprise. And then when these folks were, were bored and had some free time, uh, they were busy replacing PCs as part of our annual PC replacement program, uh, a considerable effort, and it resulted uh, in being on track to replace 121 PCs this year. 
Um, our infrastructure team was also down a key player for almost an entire fiscal year, uh, but still managed to squeak out some, some pretty impressive projects. Uh, we did an update to our city's email system. Uh, this is an on-premise email system. We have over 1,000 mailboxes. Uh, we receive 10,000 inbound emails per day, and we store about five terabytes of messages uh, on site. So the migration of all that data with knowing that this was taking place was a pretty significant effort and uh, required a lot of late night efforts from that team. Uh, they also partnered with our public works department to facilitate the installation of city owned fiber that now directly connects to our SoCal front garage. Uh, this increased our, our uh, network speeds at that location. It's gonna provide public works with some exciting things that they have planned. And then in the uh, kind of the long run, it's gonna save us uh, money. And then finally, we pushed forward uh, on a multi-year project to modernize our physical access security. Uh, this year, we were able to complete uh, work at a number of water facilities, our SoCal front garage, the wharf, uh, Harvey West Park, and we're currently wrapping up at our fire stations. Uh, on our application and strategic admin teams, uh, this past year, we had some notable upgrades. Uh, we have a timekeeping application that's used to period Kronos. Uh, that was upgraded. Our enterprise resource planning application, Eden. Uh, Eden's responsible for just about every aspect of business we do here. We do utility billing, payroll, human resources, accounts payable, uh, purchasing, and so, and so forth. Uh, this was a huge lift for our department and uh, really a lot of regression testing uh, with staff across the city. Uh, we also completed the upgrade to our document management and agenda management application on base. Uh, that's the application that produces the images for uh, your meetings and commission meetings, and it's also what publishes uh, our uh, stream to the internet. Uh, security awareness is always a big priority for us. Uh, we continued our ongoing security awareness training for city employees. Uh, this is a campaign that requires employees to watch uh, awareness videos and take short quizzes. Uh, we issue prizes to departments that complete the task first and really just kind of a fun way to help remind employees of their role in uh, and the city to remain vigilant when it comes to uh, the city's technology and resources. Um, and then last, I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the GIS stuff that's gone on. <clears throat> and uh, this was just really to uh, kind of commend Rich Westwall and it's less of a fiscal year 21 accomplishment and more of kind of a lifetime achievement award. Uh, Rich is really gifted when it comes to the marriage of data and cartography, and he continued this past year to really grow our, our GIS presence for the city, uh, for IT, and really the community. It really comes at a great value. Uh, these are just some uh, examples of the maps that Rich created, but just a small subset of that of what he's done. And he's one of our most popular yet humble IT employees, and if you've not yet done so, I advise you to check out the map section on our city's website because it's really fantastic. <clears throat> the, shifting the conversation to our goals for uh, fiscal year 22 and uh, <clears throat> really trying to align our efforts with the broader re-envision Santa Cruz objectives. Um, but at the top of our list is, is we need to get healthy. We have some key positions that we are very much looking forward to reoccupying with warm bodies. Uh, that should help us to sustain uh, our operations and really shift our focus to some project-oriented goals. Uh, our projects like our land management and permitting and licensing application track it. It's long overdue for an upgrade. We have initiated that and we're hoping to complete that in the next fiscal year. Uh, we will be hitting the streets this week with an RFP for a computerized maintenance management system, CMMS, and this will help uh, really track operations and city infrastructure and facility assets really used heavily by our water and public works divisions. Uh, My City of Santa Cruz is our consolidated online bill pay platform that was launched this year. We want to continue to add new payment types there, as well as uh, improve the services that we are currently providing. Uh, and then last, we want to continue the rollout of our physical act, uh, security project. Uh, we look forward to completing the parking garages and really shifting our focus to some of our downtown facilities uh, like City Hall. Uh, that brings us to our budget overview slide. Um, our proposed budget is about 5.7 million, 59% of that, or 3.3 being in personnel services and the remaining being in our services. And um, aside from those personnel services, the major costs for the IT department continue to be uh, the software and hardware maintenance services, as well as our telecom services, with telecom being the cost we pay providers to physically connect our various locations and provide that access. 
as far as changes from the last year, there's there's a few. Um, even though there's an uptick in personnel services, it's not an indication that we will have additional staff. Rather, it has to do with uh, an increase in IT for uh, group health and benefits and PERS obligations and those expected uh, annual salary compensation increases. So our headcount will remain at 21. Uh, on the service, services and supplies, I mentioned telecom. Um, we will be seeing a small spike in those costs because of an expiration of a Comcast franchise agreement that uh, the city received as well as the county since 1989 to receive free fiber connectivity to our courtyard, our police department, Loud Nelson and Fire Station 2 for a dollar a year. Um, so we're pretty bummed that that's gone away, but uh, we'll have to move to a costed solution for those locations and it's, uh, it's quite expensive. Um, we've also taken on some new hardware and application projects over the last year, and as each of these projects conclude, we inherit the ongoing support and maintenance or subscription fee that goes along with those services. Uh, and then finally, we have this annually anticipated uh, increase to CPI that we will pay for our ongoing contracts with vendors to uh, pay for that support and maintenance, and we typically see this as an average of around 1% to 3%. Um, beyond that, uh, we continue to really deliberately manage, manage and kind of cost contain those contracts and as much as possible try to remain status quo. Uh, that was my presentation and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ken. Um, I just want to personally recognize you guys, your help desk are the most amazing people. Um, every time I call, they're super helpful and they just jump right on things. Good to hear. Um, despite everything, you guys just were still able to service us all. So I really want to thank you and recognize your staff that does that. And I know there's a lot of other people doing a lot of important things, but that's part of the people, probably the people I touch the most um, when I'm having issues with stuff. So please, please thank them. I, will. Um, I do have Council Member Cummings and Council Member Brown with their hands raised. Thanks for that presentation. And just, you know, Huge thanks to your department. I mean, when we shut down last year and couldn't meet, um, I did, the IT department really stepped up to make sure that we could still meet and get the city's business done in a really efficient way. So really want to thank you all for everything you've been able to do to help us go digital. <clears throat> With that being said, um, one of the questions that I was, uh, I've been thinking about is, you know, this past year we've moved to everything being online, but now we're going to start shifting to kind of back to in-person meetings. But, you know, given the um, utility of being able to do like hybrid meetings, I'm just wondering how, like, are we going to continue to use Zoom? And I know that those licenses cost money. So any sense of how the, um, you know, trying to kind of maintain accessibility through these kinds of platforms, like what costs those might have or how those costs might change as we kind of come out of the pandemic. And then I guess associated with that is there's a lot of uncertainty still with all the variants and what have you with, you know, the potential for us to slide back into, you know, uh, lockdowns again. So I'm just wondering how that might play into budgeting around these services and, and things like Zoom. Yeah. So. Um, the telecommunications policy will probably need to be revisited, but we're from IT kind of approaching like this is this is probably a new normal. So we have actually built up the infrastructure that people are using to uh, connect remotely. So we feel like we'll be able to satisfy the you know, the hybrid model or the in-person and working remotely model, whatever it may be uh, for the next number of fiscal years. We spent some some of our hardware. Uh, money in the last fiscal year to really kind of put uh, position us so that we'd be prepared for that. And then I think the other caveat to that is really recognizing the security vulnerability with having folks working remotely. So we're starting to really shift our attention to what we need to do uh, from a security perspective to make sure that, you know, people connecting remotely uh, with uh, passwords that uh, they may have on stickies or whatever it may be, we can make sure that we're, we're covering uh, all of our, uh, our shortcomings there. Thank you. And I have Council Member Brown next. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ken. The question I had was related to the technology needed to get our meetings as open uh, to the public and accessible as possible, given the challenges. And um, but mostly, I just wanted to say. 
thank you so much for all the, the work that you do and your staff. I mean, your staff is just amazing. I'm going to pile on here a little bit with the mayor and say, you know, I really, really just can't can't really express enough how wonderful it is to and I have a challenge, know that there are people I can go to who are going to help me out, who are cheerful. I mean, it's so calm. You all are so calm. I just, I really just, you know, it, it's so great. You do amazing work and you do it really like cheerfully and, and, um, and, uh, calmly. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, oh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, thank you so much, Ken. Um, it was really great to get that overview and those details. Uh, my question is the website, does that, where does that fall in your, in your scheme? Uh, we have in all the technology here. The, the governance of the website is sort of a shared responsibility with Elizabeth, Elizabeth Smith and the, uh, the CM's uh, department and us. Um, but, you know, as it being a kind of a technology in our footprint, we try to do whatever we can as far as helping the content editors uh, resolve or update content. But uh, from a governance perspective, it sits with Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, and thank you to your team for being available um, through through this. I definitely have been one of those tickets. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. And Council Member Golder, did you have your hand up? No, you're good. Okay. Thanks so much, Ken. I'm sure if we have additional questions, we'll get get for the budget. All done. Thanks again. Okay. Um, I think since we're moving along pretty good here, I think we'll go ahead and um, just have our last um, uh, department uh, budget presentation. And I'd like to welcome Rose, Rosemary Menard, our water director. Hi there, Rosemary. Hello. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you today. Oops, started in the middle. Not good. <laughs> um, appreciate the opportunity, and I'd just like to pile on also with the uh, the appreciation for all of the um, uh, folks who in the those uh, central departments, uh, finance and IT and HR, who really have supported us in maintaining our business continuity uh, through this year. It, it has been a huge challenge. I know a major part of our organization sort of took a breath on whatever day that was, March 12th or whatever, and then the next day, business as usual, from a completely different uh, location. And the work that happened in uh, working with our employees as we transitioned through the COVID process, uh, working through the furloughs, it's just been an amazing uh, support. And I think when we all look back on it, we think to ourselves, holy cow, how in the world did we do all that? Um, anyway, so I would really like uh, welcome the opportunity to give you a of the water department's budget. And one of the things that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share this presentation with my new CFO, David Baum, who started uh, with us in October. So in the middle of COVID, we um, added a position in last year's budget and we were able to fill it with an extremely well-qualified individual in David. And so I'm gonna give you the front page uh, and view of the front end of this, and then I'm gonna turn the financial um, over, kind of walk through with you and then we'll take your questions. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to dive a little bit into water. We're going to do a little bit of looking back. We're going to do a little bit of looking ahead, and we're going to tell you about what it's all costing and some of the other work we're doing as we go along. Uh, this photo, as you know, is, uh, or probably most of you know, is the Graham Hill Water Plant and is a big focus of a lot of the capital planning work we've been doing, and major construction is going to get underway at this facility. Uh, here in the next few weeks, and it's going to go on for about the next eight or 10 years. So it's a, it's a major project that we're going to basically rehabilitate, replace, and upgrade this facility for the next 35 to 50 years of use in our community. Big project, uh, long overdue. Um, but what we do is we um, 
we collect water in water systems, particularly when it rains. It's kind of good when it rains, which it hasn't much the last couple of years. We, um, we obviously store and treat it, uh, both in our reservoirs and our distribution system storage. We deliver it to customers' homes. We uh, put it through, we, we provide billing to the customers and provide customer service. And there was a lot of that this year, uh, both with the COVID issues where people you know, had questions about whether they're gonna pay more if they were working from home, et cetera. And then also with the, uh, the drought, which we've been implementing the first stage of restrictions in the last month or so. Uh, do a lot of informational, educational uh, outreach and uh, working with customers and stakeholders. Obviously protect fish and natural resources, a major focus of what our work is. And we build and maintain a billion dollars in infrastructure. The, that's the, val the value of the Santa Cruz water systems, roughly a billion dollars. So we are, uh, we're really busy. We've had a, a very busy year and um, this is our org chart, which you probably can't read, but we have about 116 people working in multiple divisions. A lot of folks uh, were working from home this year. Obviously our, our distribution system and our, our operations folks here, most of these people after the very first shutdown uh, started coming to work on a routine basis and kind of haven't skipped a beat since then. Uh, but they've been amazing in producing and delivering that really important water uh, that we all depend on, making sure that the um, testing is ongoing, uh, fixing leaks, uh, dealing with our various and sundry natural resources obligations and challenges, and you know, making the water come out so that we can all sort of live our lives in some halfway normal way. Um, this has been a, a little overview of the year we've had, and I think that uh, the fire was one of the things we've talked about a number of times in uh, today's conversation. Issue obviously didn't get into town, but there were a lot of concerns that we had over the period of this fire um, and just the, the lead up to it and the aftermath that we would have major impacts uh, from the fire on either our uh, watersheds or on, our, on uh, water quality following the fire. The fact that we didn't have a very wet winter probably is the, the, big, um, the big thing that we benefited from in this particular year. Uh, we have major construction going on at the Null Creek Dam. We, uh, this uh, center photo at the top is the construction of a new pipeline under the river, which was uh, begun and completed entirely under the pandemic conditions. Uh, and that, that site is now uh, fully restored and you know back in our hands. Uh, you know, we've been doing planning on uh, replacing something at the Laguna Diversion, which has a plaque on it that says 1890, so some work is going on there. This, this big picture here on the bottom uh, right is the flocculators, which is part of the treatment facility. And then I, and I would be remiss, this is sort of going back to the um, conversation that we just heard from Ken about deploying a numbers of folks to be working from home. This is our customer service office from which he managed uh, ongoing customer service pretty much without skipping a beat for several months between about mid-March and then the first part of uh, June when they moved into the NIAC building and only recently this month have uh, the staff who was uh, sort of split up between NIAC and Locust Street has now come back but you can see that you know folks did they needed to do in spaces in their homes wherever they could and got the work done. Uh, extremely, extremely important. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn this over to David Baum to um, uh, give you the rest of this presentation and we can take your questions. This is getting into the financial aspects. And I just uh, to introduce him to you because most of you haven't had a chance to meet I will say that David came to us after you know a long and illustrious uh, career working in public finance, which completely lined up with the kinds of issues that we have since the uh, capital program and, and financing the capital program is such a major uh, focus of what we're up to these days. And so we feel very lucky.
lucky to have him join us and bring his expertise uh, to helping us with the financial planning and forecasting and management of the resources we need to reinvest in our system. So with that, go ahead and take it away, David. Okay, thank you, Rosemary, and thank you for that generous introduction, and I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so I'd like to take you through the next 10 slides, um, mostly just talking about um, operating budget, uh, capital budget, and forecasting. Um, this first slide is showing the, the primary source of revenue on the, the top two pies, um, growing about 5% from the current fiscal year to next fiscal year. It's uh, primarily driven by the 6% proposed growth in the uh, water rates that was deferred from this fiscal year due to the COVID pandemic to next fiscal year. So there was a reprieve. Um, the 6% will um, not quite probably generate 6% new revenue because it's a 5% or I should say to a 5% growth by um, lingering effects of COVID and, and now the drought. Um, the one thing we can say about operating expenditures is that the staff has been very good about um, containing operating expenditures. The budget from last year to next year is expected to drop 2%. So that's the proposal to reduce it by 2% next year from last from the current year next slide please i'm sorry there we go um okay there you go okay so this is um a look looking ahead down to, to the next fiscal year these are the goals that are outlined in the budget summary that's now is um, is on the city's website. If um, if there's one thing to uh, I suppose focus on from my perspective is that we have this big process of doing rate settings every five years, and we're at the end of the last cycle, and we're ready to start a new cycle. It's something that was introduced to um, our very engaged water commission, and then to the council um, last month. So you know that um, this bullet number uh, four here is um, to bring forward the next five years of, of rain should produce about 10% per year. So it's it's kind of a daunting task, but uh, the, um, the staff is engaged in doing community outreach right now and holding panel discussions. And so we're very excited about that. You know, much of what the water department does as Rosemary pointed out is ongoing. So the projects that were starting last year are still on, going on this year, which will be going to the next year because of the 100 plus year history of the water department. So um, anyway, for more information on this, you can go to the budget summary in the, um, on the website. Um, this slide also bears some, some effort to explain. It's, um, it's a slide that talks about, about our budget process. and. It's really a good overview and it connects to the long range financial plan that was created by the water department and approved by the city council in 2016 and that we plan to you know, bring forward again this year. But um, in that long range financial plan, we have you know, all kinds of assumptions and financial targets that um, we want to focus on and so it's a big process. It, of course, starts with the um, setting those water rates. What are the, what are the needs? Um, looking at the um, capital improvement plan, what's needed there, and really doing a long uh, a long range for with the water commission. The forecasting has, is a 15 year forecast now, but for the, today's purpose, we boiled it down to to um, 10 10 years. I want to highlight just. Um, one particular aspect of this slide here is that due to the, um, the, the need for capital improvement, um, we're enjoying now the lowest uh, rates in, in at least my lifetime for, for borrowing. And so uh, in, in this model, this, this model we've created, we're now um, putting in rates of 2.25% 
um, in the next couple of years and then 2.5% thereafter with the benefit um, loan programs um, through the drinking water state uh, revolving fund, the, the S, what we call the SRF, we've been able to get 149 million committed to the water department um, at a 1.4% interest rate over the next 30 years. And so that allows us to really um, finance the, um, the important projects that we have. Next slide, please. So this here is the um, operating expense forecast over the next 10 years. As um, the previous slide mentioned, the, you know, the personnel costs and the non-personnel costs, they grow at an average of about 4.5% per year over this 10 years. But the big growth factor is in the debt service because of the need to finance the, um, the capital investment program. So, if you look at the green bar, in the first year in 2022, it's 15%. In the last year in 2031, it's 33%, the operating um, portion of the operating budget service. And then put another way, the, the other two components, the um, basically the operating and the non the um, Personnel and non-personnel capital outlay are about 67% in the 10th, 10th year. Next slide, please. Um, so the capital improvement program, also known as the capital investment program, is funded through a mix of debt and surplus revenue, or what we call PAYGO. The, the long-range financial plan that's been adopted calls for a mix of 75% debt and 25% um, pay-go. But here, this is more, you can see more debt. And it's, it's about 85% debt, um, really focused more heavily in the first five years here. And then as the, the capital improvement program starts to taper off a bit in the out years, there's more pay-go funding is better for rate payers in the long in the long run because it means that we don't have to rate raise rates as, as as fast as in these earlier years because of the deferred maintenance on the system. Next slide, please. One of the um, targets for us is to meet the long range plan goals, and so we have these cash balances to ensure that we have the right kind of cash on hand to meet the rating agency requirements that in, ensure um, our favorable interest rates so that we can go out and we can borrow at um, the favorable rates that, uh, that we enjoy here. Um, these are the unrestricted um, balances mostly that need to be held in, in place. And um, I wanted to put dark orange category here. This is our rate stabilization fund that's a $10 million fund that we have on hand for times like this year with COVID and now some impacts from drought that we use money from that fund to revert back to our operating fund, what we call Fund 711, the water operations fund in difficult times. I'd also mention that because we're now heavily into a, our capital program, we have been drawing down on some reserves and we are about to come up with a $50 million line of credit that we'll be bringing to city council next month for approval. Next slide, please. And this is the debt service coverage slide capital program. It's always important to keep an eye on the debt uh, service coverage. Um, legally, we're required by our bond covenants and by the state loan to have a one Point two coverage, or another way of putting that, the, the net revenue is, uh, for every dollar of net revenue, a um, dollar twenty of net revenue, we have a dollar of debt. The coverage is one point two to to one. However, because of the long range financial plan, we have a more conservative coverage ratio of one point five, and so the orange line in this graph is the. Um, is the revenue, surplus revenue, and the blue bars represent the annual debt service. Next slide, please. 
And just real quickly through the capital investment program, wanted to point out that it is 291 million over the next five years. Um, it's, it's really kind of remarkable that in the last five years, it was 150 million. And so then there's a real push then to build uh, projects. And the focus in these projects is climate adaptation, water supply resiliency, um, infrastructure, and also management and risk reduction projects, including one of the things that Ken mentioned, um, being able to keep the, the bad guys out of the uh, you know cybersecurity out of the system. So there's there's those kinds of priorities, um, CMMS, the um, SCADA, uh, all kinds of systems that operate the, the, the water infrastructure. Next. And this is um, a breakdown of the types of the CIP. Um, the, the total amount over the next five years is uh, 291 million. And most of those are focused on infrastructure. And we're gonna be talking more about this tomorrow. So I'm gonna really quickly go through these. Next slide. And here again is that previous chart in the form of these bars and it shows the first year's bar is next year, and then the following four years is the second bar. And again, most of these are focused on um, infrastructure, resiliency, and climate adaptation. And the three biggest projects, of course, are the Newell Creek Inlet Outlet Project, the um, Water Tank Replacement Project, as um, Rosemary mentioned, at the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, and also the facility improvement project, also at the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant. Those three projects alone are 256 million in the CIP. And so that's, um, I missed it, that's 56% of the 291 million. So those are the big three. And um, I'll stop there. I think we're running out of time. Yes, we're, that is the end of our show and we will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Rosemary, and um, and it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from council members for the water department at this time? Um, just a couple of comments that I'd just like to make. One is, um, so we are going to be planning um, some opportunities for tours of the system and our construction projects in the next uh probably in july so I'll be, i'm going to be organizing sending out some dates so if you're interested in um going I, I probably will have you know the brand a which might be the whole system thing and maybe a couple of other things that would be construction related uh, visits particularly to the dam so um, i'm happy to do that also um we are as as david mentioned um we will be uh, we've had a very engaged water commission and they will be including in your packet that you get next week or next time for your meeting a uh, whole sort of uh, letter from them with recommendations and the process they went through in the last year or so to work the planning and uh, and the budgeting uh, and, the, and the rate making, which are really at the core of everything that uh, we're focused on these days because of our very aggressive CIP plus the you know, need to maintain operating revenue. So we've, we've been blessed with a really um, effective and engaged uh, Water Commission, and we really thank them for their participation and their partnership in all this work. Thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, David, and welcome to the city. Uh, you're working in one of it. You're working in a wonderful department. So, um, I am not seeing any hands at this point from council members. Are there any council members with questions at this point? I am not seeing any. Okay, I believe that is our last department um, uh, presentation. And so um, I will go ahead, I'm sure we'll have questions for departments as we make our way through um, the rest of the budget over the next um, several weeks. Um, but I will go ahead and um, move on to public comment. Uh, and again, this is uh, for any who, folks who have uh, regarding all the presentations that have just um, been completed. If you are interested in commenting on fiscal year 2022 proposed budget, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. 
When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. So again, I'll be looking to folks in the public to raise your hand by pressing star nine if you have, uh, if you would like to comment on any of the presentations given this evening. And I am taking a look here. I am not seeing any hands coming up from the public uh, tonight. So um, we will go ahead and move to adjournment and our council will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and we will continue with the budget presentations at that time. So thanks to everybody and thanks to all the staff for your presentations today and I uh, hope you all have a good evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.